I'd like to call to order the Gig Harbor City Council meeting of Monday, October 11th, 2021. The time is 5.33. Uh, tonight's City Council meeting is being broadcast live on Zoom. Residents can give comment during the public comment portions of the meeting by pressing the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom or by pressing star nine on your phone. Please wait to be called on at that time. Public comment on items not on the agenda will be separate from each comment portion that is at each council bill. Public comment is not a Q&A, but a time to make a public comment, public statement. So roll call, uh, council member Aversol. Here. Council member Denson. Here. Council member Franich. Here. Uh, council member Hines. Here. Council member Markley. Here. Council member Rodenbach. I'm sorry, Rodenberg. Here. Council member Wu. Here. This is Mayor Kuhn. We have our interim city administrator, Tony Pasecki. Here. Interim city clerk, Josh Stecker. Here. City attorney, Andrew Sami. Here. Public works director, Jeff Langhelm. Here. Community development director, Katrina Knudsen. I'm here. Finance Director Dave Rodenbach. Here. Police Chief Kelly Busey. I'm here. And Principal Planner Carl DeSemus. Here. Tourism and Communication Director Laura Cadet. Here. Great. And we also have uh, uh, our new officer, Ennis Robinson. And uh, tonight we have a uh, I'd like to acknowledge our um, our uh, citizens and council and uh, tribal members that are going to be giving part of the presentation uh, from the Puyallup Tribal Councilwoman uh, Bean. Welcome. We also have tribal staff Jennifer Keating, Amber Hayward, Charlotte Bash, artist Guy Kapoman. And, our, and from our art commission, we have Lynn Stevenson. And from our honorary committee, we have Tina Shoemaker. Is there anyone I've missed? Okay, welcome everyone. Please uh, join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, before we begin our council meeting, we would like to recognize that we are gathered on not only the ancestral and traditional lands of the Squabs Band of the Puyallup Tribe of Indians, but also on the site of one of the largest and longest standing historical villages of the people, the original inhabitants of Gig Harbor. Are there any changes to the agenda, Council? Okay, the agenda stands. Do I have a motion to approve our consent agenda? Move to approve. Second. Right. Second is Council Member Wu. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion passes 7-0. Our presentations tonight. First, uh, we, we wanted a good audience. So uh, we're welcoming our new police officer, Ms. Robinson. And we'll hear some words from our uh, chief, Kelly Busey. Good evening, Mayor and Council and citizens. Uh, it, it really is my pleasure to introduce to you all uh, Ennis Jody Roberson. He goes by Jody. Um, Jody has uh, been in law enforcement for 24 years. Uh, four years with Seaside, California, and then after that, just about 20 years with Seattle PD. Um, he, before that, he was an Army infantryman, so uh, he was stationed up at Fort Lewis at the end of his uh, stint in the Army. Uh, he's married, his wife, Bercy, very pleasant, has two children, uh, one attending WSU and one attending U University of Washington, so that's kind of a conflict within his family. But uh, he's a very professional police officer, very personable, uh, and is, is 
at the point in a career that he really wants to slow down and, and make a difference and take some time on calls and, and, and do some small town policing. And we're very happy to do that. Uh, I can say that he's, uh, of all the applicants that we've had and the many police officers I've been fortunate enough to hire, he is certainly one of the most pleasant individuals I've met along the way. I think he's going to fit into our police department family very, very well. And I think you'll enjoy meeting him as well. He was sworn in earlier today in Mayor, by Mayor Kuhn in the chambers. So we've already done that part of the process, but I introduce to you, Officer Jody Roberson. Welcome. Jody, can you unmute, maybe Welcome. Say hello or... Please say, uh, say a few words if you would. You have to unmute oh, here, Jody. Hit your space bar to unmute. that better? Yes, there you Thank go. You. Thank you. I'm grateful actually to be, have the opportunity to work for the city of Gig Harbor. And, and I look forward to actually meeting the community and, and the council members and everybody else involved. To, to be at a slower pace where I actually can take my time to have community com policing, that's all I wanted to do throughout my career. Instead of going call to call, actually taking the time to meet people and explore the community, you'll see me out. I'm pretty sure you'll see me out walking around. I'm, I'm ecstatic to be part of the Gig Harbor Police Department and part of a great community. And I look forward to, to meeting everyone. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. We're an honor to have you. So thank you. Yes, we are. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Our second presentation tonight is our Indigenous Peoples Day Proclamation. Uh, the proclamation of the city of Gig Harbor, proclaiming October 11th, 2021 as Indigenous Peoples Day in Gig Harbor, Washington. Whereas the city recognizes that the indigenous people of the lands that would later become known as the Americans have occupied these lands since time immoral. And whereas the city recognizes and honors the fact that the Gig Harbor is built upon the homelands and villages of the indigenous people of this region, better known as the band of the Piaw tribe called the Squabobs, and whereas the city recognizes that Native American tribes have made their continue, made and continue to make invaluable contributions to the diversity, arts, knowledge, labor, technology, science, philosophy, and economy of the state of Washington, and their historical and cultural contributions, particularly those of the Squabobs band of the Piaw tribe have substantially shaped the character of this city. And whereas the city has a responsibility to oppose institutional and systematic bigotry and racism towards indigenous people in the United States. And whereas Indigenous Peoples Day was first proposed in 1977 by a declaration of a native nations to the United Nations sponsored international conference on discrimination against indigenous populations in the Americas. And whereas many jurisdictions in the United States celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day, including the cities of Spokane adopted in 2016, Olympia adopted in 2015, Seattle adopted in 2014, and Tacoma adopted in 2018. And whereas the city of Puyallup tribe are committed to work in cooperation to build a relationship between the two governments. And whereas these actions are a demonstration of the city's ongoing commitment to strengthen the relationships between the Piala tribe and the city. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that October 11th, 2021 is Indigenous Peoples Day in Gig Harbor, Washington. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the city of Gig Harbor to be affixed this 11th day of October, 2021. Thank you. And our uh, main presentation tonight is restoring relationships with the Puyallup tribe. Our speakers uh, that will be speaking during this presentation, I'd like to introduce uh, is our Puyallup Tribal Councilwoman, Bean. Welcome. From our tribal staff, we have Jennifer Keating, we have Amber Hayward, Charlotte Bash, and also artist Guy Kapoman. From our art commission, we have Lynn Stevenson. And from our honorary committee, we have Tina Shoemaker. 
So restoring relationships with the Puyallup tribe. Resolution 1186 on September 28, 2020, we declared Indigenous Peoples Day, the second Monday in October, and Native American Heritage Month every November, and the Puyallup tribal flag to be displayed in council chambers during the months of October and November. And then I'd now like to introduce Puyallup Tribal Councilwoman Bean. Hoxlahel O C E R D C I Yachalap, Tudi D seats that Anna Bean seats that spoil Caps Chad. Good day, honorable friends and relatives. My Indian name is way over there. My English name is Anna Bean, and I'm a member of the Puyallup Tribe of Indians. I am one of the seven elected officials for the Puyallup Tribal Government, and I'm excited to be here with you all today. Um, happy Indigenous Peoples Day, Gig Harbor. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about um, the relationship building um, through the government of, of Gig Harbor and the Puyallup Tribe of Indians. I want to say thank you to each and every single person who has been advocating along the way, um, especially you, uh, Mayor Kuhn, uh, Kuhn. Um, I've really appreciated um, you actually reaching out to me directly and um, opening up the dialogue for us to have these at times can be difficult conversations, um, but they've actually been relatively positive and as you can see, us sitting in government uh, elected of, um, seats, we often inherit the positive and the negative of the folks who held our positions prior to getting there. And I think that this uh, current uh, Gig Harbor City Council has been doing an amazing job at um, seeing what has been done and what needs to be done. So I really appreciate um, the relationship building and um, I really value how you have, um, how the city of Gig Harbor has extended that reach and wanting to truly understand um, the Puyallup tribe's past and getting all of that information and becoming aware and knowledgeable in which the city that you govern. And I think that's incredibly beautiful and impactful on the folks that live here. Um, when you think about, um, you know, even in the Peninsula School District and the folks that sit on the school boards um, you know, oftentimes our children do not feel seen or heard in this community. And over the last few years, there have been great impacts to those children. And just this last week, I can speak of a specific story that involves my own child um, who had one of the Native American educators come up to them and they actually knew her and acknowledged her as a Puyallup tribal member. And after class, she asked her, how do you know that I'm Puyallup? And she said, I've watched you since you were little and my daughter doesn't, isn't very friendly to folks that she doesn't know and ran and gave her a hug. So I think that's just a sign of what this relationship building is doing and ensuring that our children feel seen and heard and um, feel like they have an ab advocate for them. And I appreciate the um, city of Gig Harbor, you know, contributing to that. Um, and you're also, as we're sitting here in, um, thank you for reading the proclamation of Indigenous Peoples Day here in Gig Harbor. Um, you also, when you do such a thing and you take the time to research, listen, learn, you also became a part, you come a part of the healing process for the people in which you're representing in that particular day. So I really wanna raise my hands to the entire um, city council for the work that you've been doing and being a partner in. And, and I really appreciate the folks that you guys have all gotten in line with, uh, you know, historical preservation language. Um, it's just amazing that you're wanting to know the real true story and the background of the Puyallup tribal people and getting that from Puyallup tribal members. I also heard, this isn't just new, this relationship building, um, when I was sitting in a Peninsula School District meeting, I had heard in there that they had um, relationship building with um, our elder Judy Wright, who has passed away. So this work is being continued by the people that she taught. So on top of it being amazing, just um, being able to be a part of this with them all, it's, it's 
it's a lot bigger than maybe sometimes you guys know when you guys are filling out those forms or getting meetings scheduled. Um, you're honoring us very deeply, and I appreciate it. Koyef Ched. Thank you. Thank you very much for those kind words. And um, uh, uh, this is a picture when we were going to do the Native American Heritage Month. This is uh, uh, Tribal Councilwoman Dean and myself uh, several years ago when we when council declared uh, Native American Heritage Month. Next slide, please. And then, then uh, this is our past city administrator, Bob Larson. I believe that's uh, tribal staff, uh, Jennifer and uh, Councilwoman Bean. So it was a, a proud moment for all of us. So land acknowledgement to be read at every council meeting uh, in October and November is before we begin this council meeting, we would like to recognize that we are gathered on not only the ancestral and traditional lands of Squabob's band of the Puyallup tribe of Indians, but also on the site of one of the largest and longest standing historic villages of the people, the original inhabitants of Gig Harbor. And I suggest council think about a, when I was working on this PowerPoint, I realized that this is actually read at, at other cities. This is read every council meeting prior to it. Now we're doing a good job with two of them, but again, I believe Tacoma reads this uh, out on every council meeting. So it, it gives us, we still have much work to do. Next slide, please. So the renaming of Austin Park at Tualacut Estuary, if anyone recognized to not take away a name, it was the tribe. And so we still, it used to be Austin Estuary and we honored the Austin family by keeping Austin Park. And this was brought by council uh, to do a resolution 1199 in February of 22 on 2021. And it was to have the mayor work with entities that supported the tribe. So this is the sign that's down there right now. And I would like to have, um, this is a sign that's going to be at Donkey Park. It was there before, but it had some inaccuracies. Uh, one thing I've learned with the tribe is not to talk in past tense, but in present tense. They've taught me a lot. So if one of the tribal staff would um, read this, then I won't botch a lot of the Native American words. <laughs> Either Charlotte or Amber, would you? Read sure. this I can give it a go. It's a little small on my screen. So I'm going to turn my camera off so you guys don't have to look up my nose or anything. <laughs> All right. A living history, the Schwabobsh. This area at the mouth of Donkey Creek was once the village site of the Schwabobsh, the Swiftwater people, a band of, of the Puyallup tribe of Indians. Gig Harbor was then known as Twalkash, meaning place where game exists in their Lashootseed language. As part of the Puget Salish people of the Pacific Northwest, the Schwabobsh spoke Southern Lashootse. They were closely related to both the Nisqually and Puyallup tribes. It is believed that the Gig Harbor Schwabobsh village was founded by a group of Puyallup Indians from Commencement Bay. A census conducted by the U.S. Commissioner of Indian Affairs in 1879 listed the Gig Harbor Band consisting of 46 Indians, men, women, and children, as most of the Schobabs were removed to the Puyallup Reservation. Village houses were built with split cedar planks with high gabled roofs covered by large cedar shakes. A longhouse functioned like a modern apartment building, holding several families in one long room. While no formal partitions existed, families stayed within their own sections, each maintaining their own cooking fires, storage spaces, and sleeping areas. Potlatches were social events held to commemorate special occasions, such as successful fishing trips, marriages, naming ceremonies, and deaths. They were a time of feasting, dancing, and drumming, and could last for several days. It was traditional for the host of the potlatch to lavish gifts upon guests. It was not coincidental that villages were located alongside rivers or tributaries. While salmon could be caught year round, the best harvests were made by placing fish traps across streams when salmon returned to spawn. Fish, clams, and other meats were smoked and dried to keep through the winter. Berries such as huckleberries, strawberries, or, and blackberries were dried. 
The Puyallup and Nisqually women are known for their basketry skills. Baskets made of dried cedar root and other native fibers are made for berry gathering, cooking, and storage. The baskets were often traded with white settlers for additional income and supplies. The men are excellent woodworkers with canoes being the finest example of their craftsmanship. A dugout canoe is made by burning out a cedar log and then carving out the interior. The canoe is then filled with hot water and heated stones to soften the wood and spread the sides further apart. Crossbars are added to maintain the shape after cooling. Many of these crafts and traditions continue among tribal members today. To learn more about the Schwabaj and Puyallup people, visit the pylon signs along the Twalkash estuary walkway and their website, Schwabaj swift water people was used to reference native peoples at Gig Harbor and Vashon Island. Speaking of the swift water that ran between both locations. Thank you so much for that. So this will be a sign. We're just waiting for two or three pictures from the tribe, and this will be a replacement of a sign that had a lot of this. But uh, now, as we find out, we were uh, fixing some of the inaccuracies. The designation of the Twalakov Estuary, Resolution 1199 on February 22nd, 2021, encompassed seven plus acres of the estuary. So as you can see, it, it's uh, Austin Park is, is within that whole area. Next slide. Uh, with Resolution 1199, the council approved, it's authorized the mayor to work with Puyallup tribe and other entities that supported the tribe to develop and install interpretive signage on the city owned property within the Tualakoff estuary and to provide educational information on the city's website and other avenues. You know, that uh, we realized that this uh, tribe doesn't like phonetics of their spelling. So what better way than let them pronounce it in their own way. So a solar powered voice box with four buttons was installed, a concreted in uh, solar panel. And the city worked with Amber Hayward uh, from tribal staff from the Puyallup Tribal Language Program so the public could hear it in the Lushoot Seed language. And uh, 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 Amber Hayward, if you would take it from here. Happy Indigenous Peoples Day, everyone. I'm very um, joyful to be here today. My name is Amber Hayward, and I will be reading um, the buttons that uh, Mayor Kuhn um, and our staff were able to put together. I think this first button, though. Josh, would you go back just so she can read the first, what the buttons are titled? I would like to also say that Lynn Stevenson worked with the tribe to come up with the graphics on this. All right, so button number one is restoring relationships. Um, and again, uh, Mayor worked with our staff to even really decide on the names of these buttons and how impactful they will be on people walking through, um, maybe not knowing anything about this project at all. And so again, we're just very grateful for this partnership um, that we were able to um, participate in. Uh, button number two is the swift water people. Button number three is restoring the name, which is the place name. Button number four is Tuoshotseed, the Lashootseed language. Tuoshotseed. So uh, button number one in 2020 and 2021, the mayor, council, Puyallup tribe and an ad hoc committee, the arts and parks commissioner, commissions and a group of citizens began working together to establish the honorary historical area to recognize the ancestral homelands of the Swiftwater people, a band of the Puyallup tribe and specifically their former village along what is now the Gig Harbor waterfront. Establishment of the historical area in the seven plus acre estuary is for educational and awareness purposes. As you enter this estuary, you will see the continued history of the tribe, an honoring Native American 17 foot tall wooden sculpture at the water's edge and photos and drawings of the Puyallup tribe's ongoing connection to this island. And um, Amber will read the other three. These are what you hear if you push the buttons. And we actually did this in the 
Piaab sound room. All right, so button number two is the swift water people, Skhobabsh. The Spoyalapabsh, known today as the Puyallup tribe of Indians, have lived on this land since the beginning of time. Our relatives that resided here, as well as on Vashon Island, were known as the Skhobabsh, meaning swift water people. This referenced the swift waters flowing through the narrows. Let's go over the Shootseed word for swift water people who resided right here where you are standing. Skhobabsh. But number three is called restoring the name, Twalkas. Thomas Talbot Waterman recorded Lashutzi place names for the local tribes, and in his archival material, give the Twalshotzi name Twalkas within the Gig Harbor area. Twalkas means place where game exists. According to a typed manuscript of Puyallup tribal elder John Hoat, Twalkas was one of the three village sites located at Gig Harbor. Let's go over the word for the Lashutzi place name within Gig Harbor, Twalkas. Button number four, Twoshotzi, the Lashutzi language. The Puyallup tribe's ancestral language is Lashutzi. Our language was referenced as Twalshotzi by our elders. Linguist Tom Hess coined the term Lashutzi, which was accepted as a general term for the language. There are 11 federally recognized tribes in the Puget Sound region that speak Lashutzi, spanning as far north as Upper Skagit, as far south as Nisqually, as far east as Snoqualmie, and as far west as Squaxin Island. There are two primary dialects called Northern Lashutzi and Southern Lashutzi. Our language is a part of the Salish and language family that extends across several states in Canada. Today, the Puyallup tribe has a thriving Twoshootsi language program where hundreds of speakers use Lashootsi in their daily lives. Thank you. The next slide. So as council had approved a resolution 1199, it allowed us to put educational history for all those that would enter the estuary. And at this point, I'd like Lynn and Charlotte to uh, explain the next step that we uh, worked on. Um, hi, this is Lynn. Um, so I'll, I'll get us started. Uh, for about seven years on the Gig Harbor Arts Commission, we had floated a project um, to put signage on these uh, pylons that were um, rescued from the daylighting of Donkey Creek Park. They have been underground for, I, mean, I don't actually know how many years, but um, the historic preservation officer at the time, uh, Lita Don Stanton, uh, decided to uh, preserve five of them and put them throughout the parks where they are here. And at some point, the, the Arts Commission had been given the task of creating some signage um, for these. Well, for about seven years, this project was on and off of our agenda. And um, just this year, when we were going over our budget, we said, what, you know, why has this project been floating on our agenda for so long? We need to, you know, revive it and let's put some momentum behind it. So we formed a subcommittee and uh, realized that this is exactly why this project has been um, floating for so long because it's a perfect time to use these pylons to tell the story of the our indigenous peoples. And uh, we found out that uh, the, the mayor had been working with the tribe, the, the, the city had a pro, uh, resolution 1199 and um, the group that was working on the honoring symbol um, had created such an abundance of, of, um, of information that came out of that. Um, and Linda Pitcher, um, Don Stanton, um, and was working with the members of the tribe, Charlotte and Jennifer, um, um, and oh, Amber, I think was working on that. So, um, it was just a perfect convergence, very fortuitous timing because they had all of this content and we had the, the space um, and it was a great time to pull, you know, pull our resources together and make these signage happen. So we 
Let, oh, oh, do you want to go to the next slide then? There we go. Um, this was the concept stage of showing what these uh, panels would might look like. Um, we're, we're in the process of developing uh, five panels that are metal and 15 inches by 40 inches tall. They'll be engraved with these five stories um, of the tribe. And what's the next slide there? Okay, the image on the left shows, um, this was, th this is an example, where is it, Fort Ward Warden? Um, this was sort of what we based the concept on, um, uh, the visually, just to give you a sense of what it will look like. And is there another slide there? So, oh, okay, this shows the positions. Um, of where each of those pylons are located. Charlotte, did you want to take over from here? Yeah, I can share a bit. Uh, <laughs> Charlotte Bash Seed Stut, Puyala Pab Shad Yafti Klatsap Nehalem. Good day, everyone. Happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, my name is Charlotte Bash. I am a Puyallup tribal member. I'm also Klatsap Nehalem. Um, I work for the Tribes Historic Preservation Department as the Historic Education Coordinator. And um, just like Lynn said, there are a lot of um, complementary projects that were going on this last year. And I know for many years before that, um, but I was looped into this project back in March um, to work, work on the interpretive signage. Um, I was pulled in, Linda Pitcher, anthropologist Linda Pitcher, who worked with the tribe um, and our office for many, many years. Um, she came to us with a draft um, of the signage that she had compiled based on her research in collaboration with our department and other folks at the tribe. Um, so that served as the, the basis for the final work. We spent about six months going back and forth. Um, at one point, I noted that it said draft 16, but I don't really know where we ended up, how many drafts went back and forth. Um, we got input from our language department as well and worked with um, the City Arts Commission and landed on five signs, five panels that will be on five pylons throughout um, the estuary, the park. Um, the first one is before Gig Harbor. So this talks about the pre-contact pre history of the area of Twalkash, of the village of the, of the Schwabaj people. The second panel is specifically on the Schwabaj, the Swiftwater people, a little bit about um, the original inhabitants of Gig Harbor and Vashon and their relationship to the Puyallupab, to the Puyallup people. The third panel is on the Puyallup tribe. So this, it starts really around the settlement period and goes up to the treaty era. Um, so up to the 1850s or so. The fourth sign talks about the Medicine Creek Treaty, um, really the historical and the contemporary impacts of the treaty and the relationships that the treaty defines um, between the tribe, local, state, and federal governments that impact us and, and all of our community members even today. And then the last panel um, is about the daylighting of Donkey Creek. So the project that took place that um, opened up Donkey Creek, it restored salmon habitat, and um, also gave us the pylons that these signs are on. Um, I think that might be the last sign. So I, I just wanna recognize, I know a lot of people were involved in this project. And um, again, like Lynn said, there were so many moving complementary um, projects happening that all fed into one another. This project informed the sign we read earlier um, and the voice boxes and vice versa. Um, so I just want to acknowledge everyone. Um, I also wanted to note that in the couple of times I was on site with those draft signs, we were just seeing them, you know, on site, what they looked like, reading through them. We saw so many community members walking their dogs out with their kids stop to read the signs um, and ask us about them. And that was just so powerful to see that we didn't even have shiny, great looking signs, but we already had community members who were in, interested in learning the history of this land um, and we're excited about it. So I just wanna recognize everyone doing this important work because it's just so important to have a community that recognizes and um, uplifts and shares um, this history, the tribal history, which is all of our history as well. So um, thank you all for doing this. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, the signs are, um, they're 316 stainless steel, which is the best 
steel, stainless steel for uh, the least amount of corrosion. So that was a big deal. And they are ordered, they are being fabricated presently, and they should be done by uh, middle of November. So at the latest. So um, we're, uh, they'll be attached with hidden, hidden screws so you won't even see it from the front. So we're excited for this. Thank you. And then for the next slide, I'd like to have a Puyallup Tribal Councilwoman Bean and uh, Tribal Staff uh, Jennifer Keating uh, talk about this. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know if we were fighting for the mic here. <laughs> That's um, up to you too. <laughs> uh, Jennifer, go ahead and start and I'll finish. Okay, awesome. Hawks Lahail, Jennifer Keating, Titsta, Poyal Chen. Good day. My name is Jennifer Keating. I'm a Puyallup tribal member, a land use planner, and the assistant tribal historic preservation officer for the Puyallup tribe of Indians. I also call Gig Harbor home. I'm born and raised in Gig Harbor. I attended the, the Peninsula School District. I'm a Gig Harbor Tides. Um, and now I have the great honor of I am our school district native ed program parent rep. So my heart is truly in this. Um, I can tell you this, we have come so far from when I was a kid. Um, back when I was in school, the native students were actually removed from the classroom to learn tribal history, which basically tells your tribal students, your history is not important enough for the rest of the classroom to learn. So to go from that, and, and I'm 35 years old, so to go from that within 35 years to honoring a, a Gig Harbor school name after the first inhabitants of Gig Harbor is unbelievable. And it's something that when I shared that with my father, um, we both actually became very emotional because we never thought we would see this day in our lifetime. So this is all because of the wonderful community that lives in Gig Harbor, who actually, uh, we didn't originally know that, that the school was up for naming. Uh, we were contacted by a phenomenal woman named Margarita, who reached out and said, hey, this is a phenomenal opportunity for the tribe to participate if they're interested. And because we have such an amazing supportive tribal council, an amazing historic preservation and language departments that were able to research the word and support it and put together a letter of recommendation, uh, we were able to work with um, overwhelming support from the Gig Harbor community. Um, the amount of letters that came in in support of this naming was amazing. Um, the community that we have felt very, very strongly for this, um, and it ultimately passed, I, I think, largely because it was so overwhelmingly supported by the community. Um, so I'm incredibly thankful for that. Uh, and then Councilwoman Bean, if, if you would want to cover what that looked like between the collaboration of, of simply naming a school and actually reaching out to your local tribe for tribal input on how to name it, and that, that huge difference there, that would be awesome. Did you just say everything? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you got this. Um, it was actually a wonderful process and how everything came through um, on this process. And then I'm um, actually sitting in those uh, Peninsula School Board meetings as this was, um, they were actually deciding this um, and, and they weren't actually all on the same page. Um, so uh, as it may be difficult even for a Puyallup tribal member to learn our language, uh, the school board was trying to learn our language at the same time and was having a lot of difficulty in that. And it went from being squabopsh to actually spelled out swift water. So um, sitting in there again, as I mentioned, we got to hear about the relationships um, over time with um, our elder Judy Wright and um, uh, former council member chairman uh, Bob Satikam actually was mentioned in there in the um, the relationship building that had been going on throughout the period of time. Um, the entire process of getting this underway has um, actually been amazing. And while we were assisting in these processes, we were learning a little bit more about ourselves through it all. And um, watching like and hearing Jennifer just speak right now, I get to watch my my fellow tribal members grow in this process as, um, you know, she's mentioning she's grown up in Gig Harbor, 
Um, my children's family has grown up in Gig Harbor and what the city of Tacoma in the Peninsula School, I mean, the uh, city of Gig Harbor in the Peninsula School District are doing for the folks that have been growing in this community with everyone else is just phenomenal. And uh, it's, it's, it may seem like a little thing to some folks to be called Swiftwater, but it, it is deeply um, Im impactful on the members of the Puyallup community, uh, Puyallup tribal community that um, have been living here and will be raised here to know that they too are being recognized uh, alongside uh, the, our fellow gay harborings. Is that the right word? I'm not sure, but um, we've really enjoyed this process. It, it, was not, it wasn't something that we like uh, the Puyallup tribal council um, when we got the information in about um, the Peninsula School District wanting to incorporate this name and um, the, what it would mean to our people, it, it, there was no hesitation to join in on this work. That's great, thank you. And um, isn't this the school that's uh, having a grand opening like within the next week or two? Correct. Um, that's happening on Thursday, October 21st at 5 p.m. That's great. That's great. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Councilmember Denson, uh, would you explain the next couple of slides? Yes, and I haven't seen the slides, so I'll do my best. <laughs> but I know that Jennifer um, can, can help with this as well because she's been a terrific partner as well as a number of other tribal staff as well as city staff. So this has been such an uplifting meeting. I have not been able to stop smiling. And I'm so excited to talk about this incredible, really unprecedented partnership that the city and the Puyallup tribe have worked on. Um, this partnership is gonna conserve 11 and a half acres of streamside forest in our view corridor that was part of the original Squabobsh village site and it's still part of the tribe's usual and accustomed lands. So by conserving this property, it's gonna mean that Squabobsh Artifacts will not be disturbed by a housing development that was planned here and that the salmon habitat of North Creek that runs right through it, you can see on the slide here, will be preserved for, for perpetuity. So yes, now I'm going to look at the slide. And yes, Public Works Director Jeff Langhelm um, was incredibly helpful. He, he helped create the path that um, will show the county and eventually show folks how we might work our way from Harborview Drive or Harborview Drive to the Cushman Trail in a in a trail that um, preserves the artifacts that are there. We've got an um, a plan that we'll create with the tribe in case any artifacts are, are disturbed. So we've got that all sorted out. I also wanna give a shout out to Jeff's um, GIS guy, Mike, who did many, many iterations of the map for us and really helped us put together a fabulous grant application. We hope to close on this property next year. Hopefully first quarter, we ranked number one of all of the conservation futures projects. and. Like Jennifer always says, it's really a unicorn property. Being a, a gorgeous forest where the artifacts have not been disturbed, being a salmon stream, and, and I'd like Jennifer to, to talk a little bit about why that was so important. And the relationship and partnership that we had with the tribe really meant a lot to the county. And Jennifer and I did many, many, many presentations to county volunteers and staff and council on this. And um, over and over again. I think they really, really appreciated that partnership. Jennifer, can you explain just a little bit about why this property was so important to the tribe? Yes, and I apologize ahead of time. I have a dog in here who, of course, is choosing to play with his loudest toy right now. <laughs> so I apologize. Um, so thank you so much. And Councilwoman Denson, I don't think gives herself enough credit of how much of this load she took on her shoulders. Um, she actually put together the entire grant application for this, um, which was a huge undertaking. We were originally going to partner with a nonprofit to do that work, but after seeing what the cost of that would have been, she said, no problem, I'm going to do it myself. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> 
she, she probably regretted it, but it was phenomenal. And like she said, this, this, this um, application actually took first place in the county. So we're incredibly proud of that. Uh, before I get into the process though, is um, there was part of the county future, conservation futures um, process is there is a required 10% match um, in order to do this. And when the property owners first reached out, once they had that tribal history, um, they actually wanted this, pro this property to originally go to the tribe. Uh, we found out very early on that the tribe legally cannot be the owner of this property. So I had the task of going to my tribal council with a package request asking for $50,000 for essentially a property we would never own. And as we all know, one of the main objectives of the Puyallup tribe is to go back and purchase land that was originally Puyallup tribal land um, for salmon habitat restoration, protection of cultural resources, natural resources, water quality. These are, these are vital to the survival of the Puyallup tribe um, and for our traditional ways of life. So going to your tribal council and asking for $50,000 for something we would never own um, was incredibly scary, to be honest. But our Puyallup Tribal Council truly rose to the occasion of where Puyallup Tribe is known as the generous and welcoming people. And um, they truly held that up. When I went to them and asked, uh, I was expecting questions. I was expecting kind of a rundown of what are you thinking? This isn't even on reservation. But like I said, our Puyallup Tribal Council is incredibly generous and approved this no problem. It was incredibly supported by our fisheries department, our natural resource department, water quality, historic preservation. Like Robin mentioned, this is a unicorn property. These properties simply do not exist anymore. Um, the fact that it's home to a historic village site, to a salmon bearing creek, um, to a tree canopy that we simply no longer have, especially on reservation, um, these properties are incredibly hard to find, and I know I don't have to tell anyone in Gig Harbor when I say the development pressures that we are experiencing um, simply cannot continue. Uh, when we have properties like this that are home to salmon habitat that is ever dwindling, it is so incredibly that we be able to take advantage of that opportunity. Um, so I'm very, very thankful that the property owners uh, they very likely took a hit when it came to what kind of money they could have made on this property, but the contribution of that family, of the city of Gig Harbor, and of the Puyallup Tribe of Indians has ensured that this property will forever be home to salmon habitat. So as salmon habitat becomes harder and harder to find, this will be preserved forever. Um, our children will be able to walk through here and hopefully thanks, thank everyone involved one day that, that this is not going anywhere, that it won't be developed and that we won't lose that critical salmon habitat. And it's a great example of why partnerships between tribes and their non-tribal um, jurisdictions are so incredibly important because we can go after property, but when we're going after, when we're identifying and going after them together, we are so much stronger in that partnership. And I'm forever grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. And now we have uh, the honorary project. We have uh, from the honoring committee, we have Tina Shoemaker. Uh, good evening, uh, council members, uh, Mayor Kuhn, uh, friends. The uh, honoring project uh, developed out of the original research by Linda Pitcher uh, who is an anthropologist and out of her passion for learning more about the early people, uh, she has provided a wealth of information that's already been referenced uh, about the Squahabish <laughs> tribe. Um, in uh, 2016, the, uh, the honoring committee was made up of Gary Williamson, uh, Lita Don, and Mark Anderson, uh, Charlie Clark Jackson, and uh, Linda Pitcher. They made a presentation to the Kiwanis Club of Gig Harbor uh, back in 2016, uh, describing some of Linda's early research and their dream of coming up with some kind of, of art that would represent the, the culture and the, uh, uh, the history uh, of the native uh, people. 
uh, our foundation made at that time the single largest commitment of funds toward that project that has had at that time ever been made. Uh, so we entered into a partnership with the city and with the uh, Puyallup tribe of Indians in order to, uh, to develop a, uh, a welcoming figure that would be representative of the early people. Uh, we went through an extensive RFP project uh, with our partners uh, in the tribe. Uh, there were seven submissions by very noted uh, native carvers. Uh, we selected the work of Guy uh, Kapoman, who you'll be hearing from later, uh, and his vision of the uh, our fisherman, our guardian uh, figure. Uh, this was the original submission of the artwork uh, that describes the figure. Uh, the figure itself is 14 feet high, uh, four feet wide. It uh, is carved from a snag, a redwood uh, uh, tree that fell on its own accord, uh, an enormous uh, tree uh, with the, that guy located in the Shelton area. Uh, as you know, redwood is not native to this area. Uh, the tree actually came from seeds that were brought uh, to this area by a homesteader from California uh, well over 100 years ago. And that tree has resulted in the creation of this figure. Next slide. Uh, this is Guy's background. Uh, uh, as I said, he was selected from uh, seven projects. Uh, he has an extensive career uh, as a respected uh, teacher, drummer, and singer. If you have an opportunity to uh, do a search for Guy's name and see his website, uh, some of his work, a lot of his work is there, but particularly his work as a drummer, a singer, and, uh, and a teacher uh, is, is really significant. Uh, he is a tribal council member of the, the Quinault uh, Indian Nation, and he has art installations throughout this region. Uh, his his uh, traditional artwork uh, is 32-foot uh, ocean-going canoes. Uh, these are magnificent uh, uh, carvings, beautifully done. Uh, next slide. Uh, the uh, the snag, as I as I said, this was this was a picture of the the snag as it was uh, as Guy initially worked on it uh, to get it into the door of his shop uh, and to set the original uh, the basis for the work. Uh, the location of the work is right out at the edge of the uh, of what is now uh, the estuary park. Uh, it was designed specifically as a welcoming figure to welcome all, uh, anyone coming into the Gig Harbor area, into the, uh, into the, uh, the now seven acre uh, area that has now been designated. Uh, it was designed to face the water, uh, to be welcoming from the water, but to be visible from the street. Uh, so the location uh, is here, it's, it's, it's high enough that it will uh, be above the King Tide, but it is right there. Uh, those of you who have been to this, this area and you've seen the picnic table, uh, it's very close to where that picnic table has been for years and years. Uh, very close to the uh, History Museum, all, all within that seven acre uh, area. Next slide, please. Uh, we were privileged, uh, we being my, my husband, my sister-in-law and I, to visit Guy in his studio as he began his work. Uh, this is a panorama shot, so it looks like the, the carving is curved. It's not really, it's distorted by the, the nature of the, of the uh, photograph. Uh, but Guy is working here with uh, traditional tools, uh, some of which he explained to us were, were handed to him by his teachers. Uh, uh, through, through a tradition of, of passing on the, the art of, uh, of native carving. Uh, so this, this uh, was the beginning. Uh, in the very back of the studio, let me back up just a second, this long thing across the entire studio, this is one of Guy's canoes that's also in, in process. You can see the size of those things. Next slide, please. 
Okay, Guy is, this is a, a, a later uh, photograph uh, where, and we have a video you'll see later where Guy is explaining the meaning of the parts of the, uh, of the work. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the front of the finished work. It is still lying on its back. So it, again, the, the distortion is, is, is perhaps a little difficult, uh, but this is the front with the, uh, uh, the fisherman holding at the, uh, the significant salmon uh, surrounded by the traditional ocean going canoes. Uh, and this is the back of the figure. Next slide. And this picture was taken by, I think, I think Jeff took this picture or at least somebody in the public works department as the figure was, was successfully brought from uh, Guy Studio to the uh, public works uh, area. And this was in April of this year. So the, uh, the committee uh, has asked uh, that I share a statement which I'd like to read to you. Uh, the Gig Harbor Honoring Committee supports the Puyallup tribe as they bless, install, and dedicate our fishermen, our guardian. We realize the importance of these ceremonies as the Puyallup and all people honor the Skohebabs. We are honored to have championed this vision for the last six years and will be humbled to witness these events as the Puyallup ancestor returns to its village. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about this project. Thank you, Tina. And then they provided a short video before we hear from Guy. Okay. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Guy Kapolman, and uh, you know I, I was uh, chosen to carve a figure to uh, to memorialize the uh, the Kualoka. Uh, Village there, what we now call Big Harbor, and uh, so we put together a, a design of an ancestor who's, uh, you know, he's wearing our, our our traditional cedar hat, the double layer hat, and uh, you know, on the inside of the hat would have been uh, have been a spruce root, have been a strong a strong root, waterproof pipe, and then the outside would be the cedar bark. And the cedar bark was usually rubbed down with uh, uh, animal oil, uh, like a bear oil or, or elk fat, to, you know, to, to help with the waterproofing. And then he also has on a vest, a cedar vest, you know, that the men of that time would have wore and, uh, and uh, to keep themselves dry. Of course, you know, we're outside doing work with fish or canoes or, you know, something along those lines. So, you know, you always, always wanted to be dry at that time. And then they've got the uh, the three tiered uh, sailor's face. You got the forehead, the teeth plane, and then the uh, the jaw plane, and from the frontal view. And then uh, you know it, go, it goes on to to your salmon, your king salmon. salmon. And uh, you know he's holding on to that salmon to show that that. Uh, that unity that uh, people have in all races of man with, with, with salmon, fishes of, of the water. And, uh, you know, that's, and especially in that area there, you know, the village is known as a fishing village there. So, you know, we, we enlarge that salmon, you know, to, to make it bigger than life so to really to emphasize that, that piece. And then we have some, uh, we have some resin pores here, the, the blues that uh, symbolize some of the water at the different times of year, of course, you know. And um, so that's that's what those are there. The other, the uh, canoe on the top there that'll be on the sides will be there'll be a canoe that matches this one on the other side, and and, and that represents that uh, you know. Uh, well, cook, they, uh, you know, the people there were the, the keepers of the narrows there, you know, and, and uh, uh, protectors of those narrows. So they always had a canoe ready, you know, in case they needed to go out and take care of some things. And that's what these uh, these symbolize. 
and they'll have the, they'll have the sound of uh, design on each beam on each side. Thank you, and um, we're excited to have some words from Guy right now. Guy, are you there? Thank you for joining us, and you have a beautiful sculpture. Thank you. I I, I just want to start by by saying, "Onogweto, uh, oh, uh, Guy Kapoman, to Queen Niles, Guy Kapoman from from Quinault. Just want to say say thank you for for all of all of the work, my relatives and friends. Uh, wonderful work that that you've all been doing. Um, just just really is a testament to to the dedication and the commitment that that you all have to to our ancestors and our 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 ways of life that are critical to us all in this day. When, when I say to us, I'm referring to all of us, all, all of us as mankind. We, we, we all live here now and share these lands and share these, these sacred sites, uh, these village sites like uh, um, you know, and, and it's just, just, just so enlightening to see that, that all my neighbors and relatives are doing this kind of work and it really warms my heart. And, um, you know, one one of the things I wanted to share that I didn't get to share too much with anybody was was at the time I seen this advertisement come out for this project. And my family was was doing some research on on some family history for for some other work we were doing, and uh, we found out that that one of our grannies was actually lived at uh, at Polkas for a time in her life. And her name was Sally Numpton, and she later married um, a Dick uh, uh, Tai Jack or Tai Jackson, and and they had a they had a son named Dick Jackson. Anyway, uh, he moved to Squaxin later on in his life, and that's where he he lived and raised his family, and um, and uh, and. Uh, he, he was the grandfather to my grandmother. So, so I, you know, it, that was at the same time. So I had this voice in my head that, that said, go ahead and, and uh, do up some, some artwork and submit it to this project. So I did. And, um, you know, ever, ever since that, that point, you know, the, the, the reassurance that, that things were moving along in the right way and, from from finding the log to 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 finding the space to work to I mean everything just kind of fell in its in its proper place and uh, you know I believe all those things would wouldn't have happened with without all of the work that all of you have done to lay this wonderful foundation for us all and um, you know as an artist you know I, I want to thank you all for 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 your commitment to, to the arts and to the history of, uh, of where we live today. So, um, you know, I, I kind of was able to explain the, the story the, behind the design, you know, the things I looked at when, when I researched, it talked a lot about that, that creek that runs right through there was a, the real heavy salmon bearing um, uh, creek at one time. And, and it is. I was there probably six months ago, and there was uh, there was spawned out um, fish right there in the creek. And I thought to myself, "Wow, this this really fits here, you know." And so, so you know, I, I, re I really wanted something to symbolize the 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 uh, salmon struggle that that we've we've gone through as Indian people here in the Pacific Northwest, and. Um, uh, you know, from from the bolt decision to 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 continuing that kind of fight to ensure that that uh, we we have a resource to fish. I mean, that's the biggest battle we face here today, through global warming and all the things that are happening out in the ocean to all of our salmon. You know, I I, I wanted that to be the centerpiece piece, and and to show 
to show how important it is and how important our relationship is with that salmon. That's why we hold on to it, you know, with, with our heart and our soul, our spirit. So, um, you know, that, that, that was the center of, of the, the design. And, and the, the two canoe, the, the uh, sale, sale, uh, the two canoes that are on the side there, um, I researched the uh, Puget Sound canoe, the the Southern Salish canoe. You know, for the it's got the low bow with the with the ears over the nose. You know, like this here, not like the West Coast is like this. I put them and so it was like that because I wanted everything to be as accurate as I could for for our area, our Salish and home there. And um, so uh, you know, in a nutshell, that's kind of. Uh, a little bit of history about the the whole the whole project you know the tree was a it's a redwood tree it, it was about 100 years old a forestry friend of mine was looking at the rings and counting all the rings and uh, it was just beautiful to carve wonderful uh, wood to carve and um and and again just just thank you for 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 all of your work getting this far silkwheel oh silkwheel dollies Thank you, Guy. Thank you very much. And thank you, Tina, for that presentation. Uh, next slide. I'm going to let people um, <clears throat> look at the, this slide for a few minutes since uh, we're going to have two of these slides. There are two of these signs. So where the star is on the right side is where this, this, is where this sign will be hung. Um, and then there'll be another sign just like it over near the restrooms at Donkey Creek because there really is no front or, or end of this uh, park. People might come from either direction. So we wanted to have two signs with um, you know, little logos showing what you're walking into. Uh, the, the sculpture, a guy sculpture is done right now. It's actually um, stored on city property right now. And uh, unfortunately the tribal archeologist Brandon Rain on was not available this evening. However, his assistant tribal historic preservation officer, Jennifer Keating is here and can provide a quick update on the honoring our timeline. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just very briefly, I wanted to say thank you to everybody for your patience in this project. Um, it's a beautiful and worthwhile, incredibly significant project. Um, however, with it being located in the shoreline buffer and, of course, on the site of a historic village site, that comes with some major complications when it comes to permitting and um, protecting our cultural resources. So we are working very, very closely with our archaeologist and with the engineer and um, the Harbor City staff to make sure that those resources are protected and that the carving can go up in a safe um, and long-term way. So we're getting very, very close um, and excited to see the, the day where it's, it's put up. And I am incredibly thankful to Quinault President Kapoman for your work. Um, our kids have had to go up to Seattle anytime that they want to learn tribal history, but to experience it in their very own backyard, our schools will finally have a place uh, where they can bring our children so that they can learn not about history in a book about other tribes, but about their very own people in Gig Harbor. Um, I'm incredibly thankful for your work. Thank you. Thank you. See you clear. Thank you. And, uh, you know, Jeff and I have been working a little bit on, you know, what that what that mound's going to look like. Do you want to kind of share, Jeff, just a hair of what where we just changed a little bit of an engineering order? Uh, yes, thank you, Mary. Yeah, we just are trying to fine tune the uh, foundation for the artwork so that we can not disturb any of the so underlying soil, um, but then also make sure that it's supported uh, and visible and viewable. So we're, we're getting close, as Jennifer Keating mentioned, and we hope to be able to proceed forward through all the last few remaining steps very soon. Great. Thank you. So we're excited by this, uh, this, this uh, map right here. Um, you know, we've kind of worked it to kind of show where the pylons are, 
show the audio box, show the carving. Uh, we we like uh, we like that the top of it talks about the partnership between the tribe and the city. And so, um, and last slide, uh, Josh. And also um, the recognition of the ancestral homelands of the Squababish people, Squababish people, Resolution 1199, uh, future establishment of the honorary historical area along the Gig Harbor waterfront to recognize the ancestral homelands of the Squabs and of the educational and awareness purposes. City staff will work with the Pial tribe to establish an area to be called ancestral homelands of the Squabs. This would be an honorary designation for educational awareness purposes only and will carry no, with it no regulatory impact. We will be working with the History Museum and the Puyallup Tribe uh, when new street names come available to make consideration of new names for streets. That's uh, one of the things we just updated in our budget this year. It used to say that we would work with the History Museum for new street names. And now we've added in our narrative of our budget, so that will carry every year, uh, the Puyallup Tribe as well. And they do that with other cities too. Uh, the city will encourage the school district to incorporate some of an ancestral homeland uh, tribal history by working with the Piala tribe. So I'd like to thank everyone. I'd also like to thank Josh Decker, who spent a lot of hours with me last week trying to put this together. It was uh, a lot of uh, time spent. And um, I'd like to see if uh, Anna Bean has, uh, Councilwoman Anna Bean has any closing remarks. Thank you for allowing me space again. Um, I, I think that the entire presentation has been absolutely beautiful. Um, uh, thank you to our uh, Quinault relative for coming on. Um, we had heard of the work in myself. That was my first time actually getting to see his face and hear his voice. And that just brings his work even, even more to the forefront for me to when you can see the artist and hear their voice and see the, the story of, of their work. So thank you for allowing that space too. Um, thank you for every single part of this and um, opening you know, this whole entire discussion up and seeing how far this has grown just in this discussion when I started off talking about the relationship between the, the government of the Gig Harbor City Council and the Puyallup Tribe of Indians and um, getting to see that actually in these slides here in the presentation and getting to see the people who are all involved in it. And I, I raise my hands to every single one of you, Spoot Boot Lachi B to Bufla Chud, um, for taking this time, understanding the importance and acknowledging Indigenous Peoples Day in this way, um, being a city that's um, in the forefront of Indigenous Peoples Day is a very big thing. And, um, you know, there's a lot of cities who have yet to acknowledge Indigenous Peoples Day. And, and I just, I'm very proud to actually live in the city of Gig Harbor and see what the city council is doing, working alongside my relatives of the Puyallup tribe of Indians and getting to work alongside you all. I, I just look forward to where this relationship continues to go and grow. And um, it's been an amazing day and again, Happy Indigenous Peoples Day, Gig Harbor. Poyef Chad. Thank you, Tribal Councilwoman Bean. Thank you. Thank you all that helped participate. And I'd like to uh, open it to uh, council members to share any comments that they might have. Okay. Would you like to jump right in or? Sure. Well, I'd like to thank, of course, uh, Mr. Mayor Kikun and all the members of the uh, Puyallup Tribe of Indians for partnering with us, all the council people, all the citizens who were involved with this. Uh, I think it was a real honor for myself to be a part of this moment, and I'm grateful for this opportunity in history. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Puyallup Tribe. Thank you so much. Um, we've grown, uh, we've grown smarter and uh, more educated uh, with your pre presence. I've, I've learned so much from all the, all the tribal members. So thank you. And that concludes the presentation. Um, thank you very much. Uh, our, uh, I have no mayor's report. So is there any city, is there any city administrator's report? 
Uh, yes, Your Honor, I just want to let uh, council know that uh, the recruitment for park manager moves along. Uh, I've narrowed it down to three finalists and I am working to get uh, each of them to come in and have an in-person interview with myself, Mayor Kuhn and Councilmember Markley. Uh, my goal is to get that done by the middle of next week and hopefully make a decision by then. So that's my report, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. And our first item tonight of council bills is old business. Yes, council member Abers Uh You're on mute. I think we had to do public comment coming up it's next. Oh, and then I, I'm sorry, thank you very much for that. Thank you, I was gonna ask if we could maybe take a five minute break, just kind of reset before all that. That's sure. Gonna be, gonna be a lot of that. <laughs> sure, okay. Uh, Thank you very much for that. And we will take a five minute break. Uh, we will continue the uh, Gig Harbor Council meeting of October 11th. Uh, right now it's for public comment on non-agenda items. So if there's been anything um, that's not on the agenda, the tribe would actually not be considered on the agenda, even though it is, because there was no other time to speak. So just so people know. Um, uh, Tony Pasecki, were there any written comments on non-agenda items that were turned in? No, Your Honor, there was not. Okay. I will open it up to the callers. Um, you can give a comment by pressing the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you are calling it into the Zoom meeting by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone. When using your phone to call in, you may need to press star six to unmute yourself. Your name or your last three digits of your phone number will be called out when it's your turn to speak. Please say your name and your address. And again, you have three minutes and it's not a Q&A. The first caller is JJ. Go ahead. Hi, I um I looked for an agenda online for this meeting and I didn't see one. Uh, so perhaps I missed something. I'm wondering when and if the topic of the moratorium on short-term rentals is going to be discussed, if it's part of this meeting. It is, it will be um, public item number, um, I'm sorry, it's right here. It's the first or second one, it's the, what am I looking at? Yes, it's going to be it's going to be one of the first two items following the this public comment. Okay, and is that agenda published somewhere? Yeah, it is on our website. So okay. um, these are important I, questions to answer you. That's why I'm answering them. But yeah, it is on our website. You know, feel free to always call our city uh, clerk Josh Decker if you need any assistance. Okay, thanks. Thank you. A caller of uh, one two. I'm sorry, what? Yes, one, two, five, three, eight, seven, four. Hi, Tom. Caller eight. Go ahead. Good evening, Mayor Kuhn, ladies and gentlemen of the council. Can you hear me okay? They can. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, I was a little confused, Mayor Kuhn. Did you say that? Um, the indigenous people presentation was not considered on the agenda because public comment was not allowed. I'd like to make a brief comment about it. Am I allowed to do that or am I prohibited? No, that's, I wanted to be able to have people comment on anything except for what's on the agenda. And since that is not like a council bill, this would be the appropriate time. Okay, um, my question is very simple, very straightforward. So I've heard lots of people talk about Gig Harbor's need to acquire acreage in the Donkey Creek drainage to protect salmon habitat. And this is a question, and I understand it's not a Q&A, but I am respectfully requesting that council and you, Mayor Kuhn, answer this question after I've completed my, my question here. So the Endangered Species Act, which the salmon are under that protection, under the Endangered Species Act, um, a developer cannot come in and do anything that would degrade salmon habitat. So when I hear that the city is doing all these great things to acquire property to protect salmon, 
protect salmon habitat and prevent development, uh, it brings forward a question. So if Endangered Species Act, federal law, state law says you can't do anything to degrade salmon habitat, then why does the city of Gig Harbor need to partner with the Puyallup tribe to acquire property to prevent development, to prevent degradation to salmon habitat? That's the question I'm asking for an answer to. Um, the other question, it's not a question, it's a statement. Um, the crosswalk that goes from east to west across Gansey Avenue um, is poses an imminent threat to any child or anybody in a wheelchair. Um, if you try to cross that crosswalk from east to west, um, people coming, turning right off of Hunt Street Northwest, and I've almost been hit myself in that, inter in that crosswalk multiple times, and it needs to be addressed immediately. There are no, no studies needed, but a person making it, a, a negotiating that corner may not see somebody in a wheelchair. In fact, they won't see somebody in a wheelchair or a child until they hear them hit the grill of their, their car. And that's um, a tragedy. And I, I felt compelled to bring that to your attention. Um, the other issue is um, public records request dated September 25th, 2020, would take about five, actually five seconds to complete based on the records requested. And we're well over a year and I continue to wait for a completion of that request for public records. And to me, that's um, very disturbing. Um, it's an indicator of a government's um, ability to provide leadership to its community in a manner that's, um, you know, it has integrity, it's honest, it's open, it's transparent. So I'm asking that city council and you, Mayor Kuhn, get together and say, let's get this guy's public records request complete it immediately and let's get it to them. And it happens to be state law. So I thank you very much, Mayor Kuhn, for allowing me and Mayor, ladies and gentlemen of the council for allowing me to speak this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other callers wish to raise their hand? Okay, I will close the public comment on non-agenda items. Uh, and and our first item is, is what that caller talked about. So, a public hearing of ordinance, uh, old business number one, public hearing of ordinance 1467 and adoption of findings of fact. Um, the report was by our principal planner, Carl Pesimus. Go ahead, Carl. Well, thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, members of council and the public. Uh, as noted, uh, tonight council will hear public testimony as required by the revised code of Washington. <laughs> Uh, and resulting from the council's adoption of ordinance 1467 on September 27th, 2021. This ordinance enacted a six month moratorium on the city's acceptance of new lodging level one applications, which is in place until March 27th, 2022. In addition to the public testimony, te testimony you may hear this evening, several written comments were provided to the city clerk and were included as part of your packet. As a reminder, the reason for the moratorium is that the Gig Harbor Municipal Code does not adequately address all types of lodging, specifically short-term rentals. Tonight, staff recommends the council take the following actions. Number one, hold the public hearing with regards to Ordinance 1467. Number two, formally adopt the whereas clauses contained within Ordinance 1467 as findings of fact in support of the moratorium. And number three, direct the Planning Commission to study the matter and bring back a recommendation to Council on or before February 28th, 2022. So a little background that uh, since Council passed Ordinance 1467, there have been a lot of questions out in our Gig Harbor community. The city felt it would be a good idea to help answer some of those questions by posting some information on the city's website. The website includes a link to a frequently asked questions document, and I also thought it might be a good idea to hit on a few of those points uh, from that information and a couple of additional thoughts. Um, so these are just a few bullet points here um, to, to highlight uh, some of those items from the FAQ. So the first one is that this moratorium is not a ban on short-term rentals, but a pause on the acceptance of new applications. And we've heard a little bit from the community that, um, that uh, folks fear that this is uh, that we're that this moratorium is an outright ban on short term rentals and that's that's actually not the case we're just putting a pause on the acceptance of new applications at this time. 
A dwelling must be rented for no more than 30 days to be considered a short-term rental. If someone leases their house for six months out of the year, for instance, it would be considered a lodging level one use. It would, uh, excuse me, it would not be considered a lodging level one use nor a short-term rental. The city has not received any formal complaints about short-term rentals, but has heard informal complaints about them and has heard that some neighborhoods fear the use could become so prevalent as to erode its character. The city does receive lodging tax from short-term rental uses. The city has accepted approximately $14,000 to date in 2021. The moratorium has no effect on short-term rentals and lodging level one uses that have been legally permitted. It only prohibits the city from accepting new applications as stated before. Staff estimates there are approximately 44 current short-term rental listings within the city limits. Of those, only one is properly permitted. Additionally, three complete permit applications are in process of being reviewed. Finally, what the moratorium does for the city is allow time for staff analysis, planning commission and council study and additional public input. To this end, staff again recommends the following actions by council this evening. Conduct a public hearing, adopt the whereas statements in ordinance 1467 as findings of fact in support of the moratorium, and direct the matter to the Planning Commission for further analysis with the condition that a recommendation is brought back to Council on or before February 28th, 2022. Mayor, this concludes my presentation and I am available for any questions uh, Council might have. Thank you. Any clarifying questions from Council? Yes, go ahead, Council Member Denson. Yes, uh, Mr. DeSemus, could you repeat the number um, of applications you have currently for short-term rental lodging level one you mentioned? We currently have three applications that are um, that are in process. One has uh, has been to the hearing examiner and is um, in the appeal period, and two are in the notice of application period. And so those will continue moving forward despite the moratorium. That is correct. And then another question I had. Um, for any of these units that have um, that are permitted, does that permit run with the land? If somebody sold the home, would it continue to hold that conditional use permit, or would it like expire or, or not transfer? Uh, my understanding is that a conditional use permit would run with the land, Council Member. Thank you. Good question. That's a good question. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, with that, we will open uh, the public hearing. So we are opening the, the public comment time. Councilmember Rodenberg has a question, Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead, Councilmember Rodenberg. I, I think this is a question more for Josh. Uh, Josh, were there any uh, requests for public disclosure, docu document disclosure for this item? Uh, we did receive one request for public records. Um, it, what that request was for information on, I believe it was for applications that are under process and applications um, that had already been approved. Okay. It also included all communication uh, in and from the city on short-term rentals. So I guess this is a procedural question. Uh, when we, when the city receives those, so they go straight to you for something like this, that's uh, the, Obviously, this person wanted a quick response, uh, or anybody on any item would want a quick response if, in fact, we're going to discuss it at a council meeting. So, what is the process when they come to you? Do they go somewhere else? Do they get vetted by someone else? Or do you get them and then put them into the uh, order like we uh, practiced in the new ordinance we passed? Uh, those come straight to me. They should all get referred to me, and then I determine the order that they get filled in. Um, I think this one in question, it was just when someone asked for records that are of that magnitude, it takes us time and we can't get them turned around quick enough. So it would be unreasonable for somebody to ask for a records request uh, if it was just five days before uh, council was going to discuss the subject. Is that right? It just depends on the scope of the request. A lot of requests we can fill uh, within a day or two, but when you ask for ask us to search all city communications, it's going to take some time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, I've opened up the public comment, public hearing. Um, 
you have uh, please state your name and address. You have three minutes. Anthony, uh, Ann, or Elizabeth, go ahead. Uh, yes, caller. Uh, it says, go ahead. Okay, so if you want to um, just uh, another heads up, uh, you can, you may have to press uh, star nine on your phone or using when your phone call and you may need to press star six to unmute yourself. Can you okay. hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Kuhn and members of the city council. I'm Peter Kadich and my wife Liz and I own a home at 3509 Ross Avenue in the Millville neighborhood of downtown Gig Harbor. I also have 43 years of experience working in the field of land use planning, recently retiring from the city of Gig Harbor in 2020. My wife and I have owned our home for 42 years, and over those years have seen many changes to our community. I believe that for the most part, those changes have improved the quality of life enjoyed by those who live and visit here. However, over the past several years, Single family homes in the Millville neighborhood have been legally and illegally converted into bed and breakfast uses and a short term vacation rental use is currently operating two parcels to the east of us. I believe there are a number of unpermitted short term rentals in the surrounding area. These changes are slowly eroding the single family character of our neighborhood and potentially adding nuisances such as noise, traffic, and parking problems to our area. The city's comprehensive plan land use map designates our, designates our neighborhood as residential low intensity and the plan promotes the protection of such residential areas. The city's R1 district zoning designation promotes low density single family development and the preservation of the established character of such areas. The proliferation of short-term vacation rentals poses a threat to the character of Gig Harbor's single-family neighborhoods and a particular threat to the historic Millville neighborhood with its proximity to the waterfront and the city's downtown area. The city's existing regulations governing short-term vacation rentals are lacking in scope and clarity and need to be revised to address the threat that such rentals pose to our historic single-family neighborhood. My wife and I would strongly support the interim. My wife and I strongly support the interim zoning regulations adopted by the council at its meeting on September 27th, 2021 under ordinance number 1467 and encourage you, the planning commission and staff to develop implementing zoning regulations that properly regulate short term vacation rentals. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, next caller is the O'Briens. Good evening, everyone, and I appreciate um, this time. I had one question. You mentioned um, during the previous discussion regarding the rentals that approximately 40 were even legally uh, taxed or no taxes were collected. What procedures are going to be put in place to crack down on those? Is, and that's pretty much all I had. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, this is just a question for, uh, for Mrs. Knudsen. Um, did you have any, were we going to answer some sought after questions after this? Mayor, um, if there are additional questions from the public testimony, we will be updating the frequently asked questions sheet and that will be posted to the website tomorrow. Okay, so so that I don't pick and choose on Q&A since it's really not a QA. If we can, um, if uh, Mrs. Knudsen uh, and Carl, if you would jot down questions that may come in and then as you just indicated, we will post those questions on our website tomorrow. Great. Thank will you. do, Mayor, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Council Member Franich, you're on mute. But this is a public comment, so go ahead. Yeah, I just, we, we need to get the addresses. Okay, okay. Um, JJ, uh, it's your turn to talk. Please state your name and address. 
Yes, my name is Jean Junot and I live at 3012 Hunt Street. Um, I have a home with a separate entrance downstairs and I have been running um, a short-term rental for the last four years. Um, before I even uh, thought about doing it, I contacted the city specifically asking whether or not any permits were required and I was told there was not. I am wondering because I haven't seen it addressed in, I live in the home. Um, I'm wondering because I haven't seen it addressed whether there is a distinction between a property where the homeowner lives in the property and rents a room or more than one room. Um, whether is it, there's a distinction, I noticed that there is a distinction in lodging level one, two, and three applications as to whether the main entrance to the rooms go through a lobby or whether it's a separate entrance. Um, I suppose that differentiates um, a, a hotel or an inn somehow, but that distinction, especially the distinction between level two and three, is sort of lost in the, in the basic description I read. So I guess one question I have is, am I correct that if you live in the home and you're renting a room in your home, you're not required to have a separate short-term rental permit? And if that's not correct, I was given misinformation. So I now fall into this moratorium because I don't have a permit for my property, even though I've been running a short-term rental for four years. Um, to just address uh, the comments, <clears throat> this is a home that, um, that uh, I am very respectful of my neighbors regarding having a short-term rental. In fact, they all know and they are very aware when I have guests on the property. And um, I've put in place rules uh, for my guests that specifically relate to respecting my neighbors. So I think um, to put a wholesale label on short-term rentals as being a cause of additional noise, inconvenience and whatever for the people who live there, that's an assumption. Um, and uh, I think I'm demonstrating that that is not necessarily the case. So if it's possible to answer those questions, Mr. DeSemus, perhaps um, about the classification on who requires um, a, a license, um, if it's possible to answer that now, that'd be great. If not, if that could be added to your FAQs, that would be terrific. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll add it to it because um, otherwise that's, this is a public hearing to hear your comments, um, but we will add that to it tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, next caller is James Carrier. Go ahead. Hello, folks. My name is James Carrier. I have partial residency at 5602 High Acres Drive. I work for a company called Vacasa. We manage vacation rentals in Gig Harbor. We have six active rentals, one of which is in city limits, and four more that are going to be onboarding here over the next month or so. I wanted to read uh, from our rental agreement a portion that is called the good neighbor policy. Because the property is privately owned, all occupants must comply with this good neighbor policy. Please treat the property with the same care you would use with your own residence and leave it in the same condition it was in when you arrived. To prevent theft or damage to furnishings or your property, you agree to close lock doors and windows when you are not present at the property and upon checkout. You and other occupants agree to conduct yourselves throughout your stay in a manner that is respectful of and not disruptive to the neighbors, traffic flow, or the community, and that will not prompt complaints to Vacasa from police, neighbors, neighborhood or homeowner associations. Noise audible outside the property is prohibited between 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. You and other occupants agree to abide by all applicable parking restrictions and limitations. That concludes that portion of our rental agreement. What I would like to uh, say to finish up here is when I am speaking to people about short-term rentals in Gig Harbor, my process, the methodology that I'm using with folks, it's value over volume. I don't want to fill your property up 200 nights with an underqualified guest. I wanna fill it up the appropriate amount of time with somebody who's paying the appropriate amount to stay in a beautiful home and make memories with their families. There's obviously this party stigma that comes along with this, but people who are dealing with short-term rentals in the neighborhood, they could rent that property to a long-term tenant who could be absolutely horrible. 
Uh, and on that flip side, you now have a tenant, in my opinion, that you know is not going to be is going to be there much longer, uh, and ultimately is is a more challenging tenant to have next to you for a long term period. That is all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, our next caller, um, let me just reset my timer, is Bob. Go ahead, Paul Kazik. Uh, Paul, you may have to push uh, star six to unmute yourself. Okay, uh, how's that? Sounds great. Okay, uh, Paul Katzik, 3518 Harborview Drive, Gig Harbor, 98332. Uh, I have submitted uh, four exhibits uh, for consideration. Uh, first of all, I uh, fully agree with the need to uh, eliminate gray areas and, uh, and come up with some uh, reasonable regulations concerning short-term rentals. The, uh, uh, to give you an example of the, the gray area, an earlier caller, a lady, uh, said that she lives in her uh, short-term rental, has for four years, and she was wondering what her status was. If you went to the planning department, uh, they have indicated that short-term rental should be uh, lodging level one. Yet if you go to lodging level one, it specifically exempts uh, people, uh, the lodging where the person is actually living on the property. So it, it's a contradiction and that needs to be cleared up. So sending this to the planning commission to uh, do due, due diligence and uh, accept stakeholder input, I think is a good idea. On the four, uh, you, you should have before you the four exhibits. The one that I, the first one, exhibit one, is a map of the uh, Gig Harbor and lower Key Peninsula areas. And uh, unlike the city's estimate, uh, just going on the different websites, the uh, VRBO, Vacasa, and Airbnb, which are the big three, I can only find 26. And surely there would be a few more, but I doubt if 44 is the number, but that doesn't make any difference. The, the, the bottom line is, is that these do exist. And yes, there are very few that are permitted. Hopefully we can come up with, uh, with some logical, uh, uh, logical permitting process and rules and regulations through the planning commission. Exhibit two is a, a kind of a bullet point of considerations for short-term rentals. The kinds of things that the planning commission should be looking at. What are our goals? What are the kinds of rules and regulations? Uh, exhibit three is a spreadsheet that compares short-term rentals and long-term rentals, the pros and cons. I would ask you to pay attention to that uh, because I think it's fairly comprehensive, but certainly there would be other items there. And exhibit four, I think is uh, an important one because the, it, in the planning and building commission meeting of September 7th, it was indicated that there might be a tremendous rush of people trying to uh, buy up the housing stock in Gig Harbor. And although I'm not a realtor, I'm not a banker, I have been in business and a person who's had to have uh, meet payroll and look at cash flow in the business. And if uh, someone were coming in to buy a home in say the Millville area, and I have a little chart at the bottom of about 16 or 17 houses that have sold in that area in the last few years, the, uh, the median price is about a million dollars. And if you were to go through the typical process uh, that you would with any kind of business and mortgage the, the building, uh, set it up and do all of the things that are necessary to actually set up a short-term rental, you would probably come up with uh, a nut of about $4,500 a month that you had to make in profit, or not in profit, but just get a, a net from your rentals. And that's pretty hard to do in today's market in that area uh, with the, the, the nightly rates and the uh, demand. If you get out farther out into the county, you go to the East Bay neighborhoods where you have all the waterfront amenities, uh, they certainly command a much higher uh, nightly fee. But I think Paul, if you look at this- we're gonna have to wrap it up though, because it's at four minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Richard. 
Hi, I'm Richard Moser at 46 Point Fossick Drive in Gig Harbor. And my wife and I currently operate an Airbnb in Tacoma. Uh, to operate there, we had to get a license to have a rental property. We operate our property through Airbnb. They collect payment from the guest for us, and they also collect and remit all the appropriate taxes. And I just looked uh, before during this meeting, we pay about $20 per night, each night that that property is rented out. So if it was rented every night of the month, that's about $600 in tax income that's available for the city of Tacoma to do something with. Um, I think the comments that have been made in what I would consider to be in favor of uh, Airbnb or short-term vacation rentals have been um, been very sensible. And I would hope that the planning uh, department really looks closely at what any real problems are, as opposed to just general talk about the neighborhood's going to go to down the tubes and there's going to be a lot of traffic. Um, any given property can only support so many people. And if it's, whether it's as somebody else commented, whether it's rented for a year or for one night, it's still going to basically contain, contain the same number of people. And our experience has been with uh, our guests that travelers generally only have one vehicle. Um, you know, in our own personal ho household, we have three vehicles for two people. Um, so I think, you know, the impact on the streets and the traffic is actually going to be less with a short term visitor than it is with a long-term visitor. So I would just urge the planning department to be, you know, look at it very closely and see if there even are problems that need to be addressed. I don't think there's anything to stop anybody in the city, anybody in the city of Gig Harbor from renting out their house anytime they want. So it's just a question of how long is the property rented for? And the fact that it's rented for one night instead of one year, I don't think really makes any difference. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, go ahead, caller Haley Nichols. Hi, my name is Haley Nichols. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, just please. I'm, I'm, at, I'm at 8811 North Harbor View, Suite C. Um, I'm a business owner and property owner in Gig Harbor City Limits, and I am really surprised at the reaction by the city council and the mayor from the September 7th meeting where Katrina Knudsen suggested that there be a study and some research done in order to react to the Airbnb and VRBOs for 2022. I am at a loss for words that her suggestion for a research study has turned into an emergency moratorium. The requirements for an emergency moratorium is that there's public safety at risk and I don't see that here. Um, I've heard several comments from several of the councilmen and women about questioning why there's emergency that was needed. I still haven't, uh, I have not heard a satisfactory answer as to why that was imposed upon us and not given the citizens and the residents and the business owners a voice in this matter. I, I have a business in Gig Harbor that uh, my employees used to come to from Seattle, Bellevue, all around the Puget Sound. And they would come here and they would work, but because of COVID, doesn't make sense for them to come to the office anymore. So I have extra office space. So we wanted to get creative about how to use this space and allow it for out of town guests to be able to enjoy Gig Harbor. So we want to turn in that extra space into a uh, short term rental. But it, while we were in process, um, we're given the runaround for two months just to have our application accepted. We were getting hurdle after hurdle and asked for things that made no sense to us. And when we asked for clarity, that was also uh, made very difficult. So while we're not even in the application process, but we were starting to you know, submit documents, we are now not able to proceed with our plan. So we have to wait six months for the planning commission, city council, the mayor to decide that they have enough information and facts for me to move forward. What I'm hearing from everybody I've talked to, what I'm hearing on this call is nobody is disputing the fact that we need to revisit the codes and we need to look at this 
and we need to come up with some guidelines and some standards. But the heavy handed just mandate and the, the stop to, to anybody proceeding with their projects to me is alarming. I would hope for more partnership with the city, with the mayor, uh, with Chamber of Commerce, with the citizens, with the business owners. And what I saw on September 27th from the recommendation on September 7th to the 27th tells me that there was a whole lot that happened in between there that didn't include any of our interests or comments. There was no reaching out to anybody that was gonna be impacted by this. And that saddens me. So I would hope that you would look at a lot of the information that's been presented to you tonight and consider an alternative reaction to the request to revisit the codes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Carolyn Berg. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my name is Carolyn Berg. I reside at 3526 Harborview Drive. I'm speaking to the six month moratorium for short term rentals. I wanna give you some background. The home I'm focused upon as a possibility of a short term rental is lo located across the street from my primary home. The home is located at 3523 Harborview Drive. The home was built by my great grandfather, Luca Ross, in the early 1900s when he came to Gig Harbor from Croatia. He purchased waterfront and upland property where members of our family reside today. He was one of the first Croatian settlers. He raised his family in the home, then passed the property down to my grandmother, Emma Ross Bebic. My mother was raised in the home. I inherited the home while a student at Pacific Lutheran University as I began my studies to become an educator. My father and I agreed with a simple nod that he would help me remodel the home, updating the electrical and plumbing among other initial improvements. That was in 1978. The nod included a promise to keep the home in the family. Since that time, the home has had many improvements. It has an unobstructed view of the Jerkovich dock and rentals and a 12 slip marina owned by Michael Hurlbut. The new dock, the new deck, excuse me, I had built provides hours of beauty to those who reside there. Most recently, I had a new roof and gutters installed as well as a complete exterior paint job. The windows have all been replaced with energy efficient vinyl windows and the heat system was updated when I acquired the home. The interior has been fully remodeled as well. While Ansich Park was being constructed, the sewer system failed. That resulted in a $20,000 repair the repair to the sewer system included a pump grinder, which was installed in 2020. My two children, ages 36 and 34, were born while I was living in the home. In 1991, the home became a long-term rental when we moved into our new home at 3526 Harborview Drive. In 2006, my daughter moved into the old family home and resided there during the time her two children were born. My daughter and her family lived in the home for 12 years before purchasing a home off Lombard, just past Gig Harbor High School. The home is presently again a long-term rental. I taught grades kindergarten through middle school for 28 years, 23 in the Peninsula School District, but that career abruptly stopped when in 2015, I found myself with both parents incapacitated in two separate hospitals within 24 hours. I was teaching remedial reading in the Tacoma School District at close to the top of my pay scale as a longtime teacher with a master's degree. I decided family first, resigned from my teaching position to care for my parents. My father passed in 2017 and my mother in 2019. They were landlords for many years to another property within the city limits, as well as the former Lucas Landing. So I learned firsthand how to be a successful landlord. I have been a landlord for 37 years. My rentals are my only source of income. I've never had a complaint filed or reported for my care of my properties, nor the tenants that reside in them. The time and diligence to keep them in top condition, both interior and exterior is a full-time job. I don't have up? any item in the home to remain in inoperable condition. I understand the city is discussing short-term rental owners to hold a business license in the city. I also understand that rules and regulations such as health and fire safety may be on the table for discussion. Those types of mandates are reasonable if they, if they apply to all short-term 
rentals within the city. My concern is a mandate that limits property owners to I need you to wrap it up. I've let you go a minute past. To the so. fact the city has decided we have enough or we have reached our limit. I do hope that you will not vote in favor of limiting rentals within Millville or any part of the city limits. Thank you. Okay, caller 1832-516. Uh, caller 1832-516, you may need to press star six to unmute yourself. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Yes, please state uh, your name Edward and address. Nadler. George, I'm sorry. Edward Nadler, reside at 9401 North Harborview Drive. Um, <clears throat> short and sweet, I, I think the question should be, what does Gig Harbor wish to be? Is it a community where people live in their homes, raise their families, et cetera, or is it a place for revenue and investment? Um, several people have discussed the needs or desires to do this, but are, are we a tourist destination to generate revenue or is it a place for people to live? Um, that is it, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Megan Bennett. Uh, Megan Bennett, yes, go ahead. Hi, yes. Good evening, Mary. You have, a, you have a really big echo if there's any way. Do I have a really big voice right now? No, it's an echo. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council, and concerned community members. My name is Megan Bennett. I'm located at 5812 Hunt Street. I am both uh, personally and professionally invested in this issue. My professional impact statement was submitted electronically. So in the consideration of time, I will only speak from my personal perspective. In December of 2020, my husband passed away unexpectedly. As primary support for our son, I had no other choice but to move in with my parents. My son and I miss having our own home Though we are very lucky to have even the meager 200 square feet of space, as many people do not have the option to live with their family. Short-term rentals have been a much needed outlet for my son and I to enjoy small amounts of time together. I've rented through VRBO and Airbnb frequently over the past year, occasionally in Gig Harbor, though our options are limited. These homes are an opportunity for my son and I to bond. We explore and heal, cook, play, read, watch programs, or just do nothing at all. Filling a void while we wait for a more permanent solution. They are, for now, our affordable housing experience. We are an example of your average people looking for a quiet respite from our everyday lives. Not out to destroy a small town charm, but to appreciate and enjoy new places and experiences. We build new relationships, eat at new restaurants, enjoy fun activities, watch sunrises, the local flora and fauna. I absolutely love the city of Gig Harbor and have lived here for many years. My great grandparents were homesteaders on the Key Peninsula. I am rooted and invested in the long-term goals of our town and want it to be the place that retains an old world charm but shouldn't we also be proud to share this beauty with others? To do so is only a benefit. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, I don't have any other callers yet, but um, uh, you, if anyone else wishes to speak, you press the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you're calling into the Zoom meeting by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone. When you're using your phone to call in, you may need to press star six to unmute yourself. Uh, go ahead, Boyd Abdiz, sorry. Uh, Bold, Bold Abdiz, go ahead. Hi, this is uh, Kenny and Kelly Arnold with Bold Abodes uh, here in Gig Harbor. Uh, 93rd Avenue Northwest. Um, we've been 
running Airbnbs and short-term rentals now for six years to do this professionally. I uh, just would like to say to the council, the last thing we want to do is bring in partiers, bachelor parties, bachelorette parties, or anything like this. Uh, keeping the homes at the top level that they can be at is one of our standards. Uh, bringing in people that are against that is nothing that we want to do at all. Uh, <clears throat> the moratorium has affected our future within the city for the next six months. And in talking with <clears throat> possible uh, clients for the future, this has been a main concern of ours. Uh, basically just want everyone to know that the owners of the houses, as well as the management of the houses, only want to make the houses better, to beautify the community, as well as bring in respectful guests that are going to be tourists for the town, bring money to the town and have them be able to see the town in different ways rather than having to fill in hotels. Uh, that's all really, we're, we're respectful business owners within the community who want to give the community the beauty that uh, everyone else gets to see as well. So thank you. Mary, you're muted. Thank you. Um, any other, I don't have any other callers that have raised their hands, so I will give it a moment. Mayor, before um, before you conclude the public hearing, the the caller that was JJ off of Hunt Street, if if they're still on the phone, could they contact Carl uh, directly regarding their situation? I don't believe that would be a broad one that we would put on an FAQ. If okay. JJ is still listening, please contact Carl Desimus directly. Uh, she she is. So, um, I JJ, I, I'm sure you heard that. Contact Carl. And um, yeah, okay. Just one moment, Jenny. Uh, it, can I conclude this before I, I call on you? Please. Okay. okay. Okay, I will close the public hearing. And um, so the public, I've closed the public hearing. And so it's uh, council deliberation and action. Council member Wook. Thank you. I move to adopt whereas clauses contained within ordinance 1467 as findings of fact in support of adoption of moratorium and direct this matter to the planning commission. Okay, do I have a second? Okay, uh, there's no second. I'll second. Okay, there's a second um discussion obviously there's going to need to be some discussion with that council member denson just a quick question did you um have any written public comment did i miss that i'm sorry um, i jumped in earlier yeah tony do you want to mention that yes we uh, we did receive quite a bit of public comment and josh appended the electronic um agenda with all of that uh, public comment. And Josh, I think you sent an email out to that effect as well, correct? That's correct. With a formal public hearing, we announced in our advertisement that written comment will be ex accepted up to a deadline of noon today. And in that note, um, which is our standard procedure, we note that the comment will not be read at the meeting. It's just entered into the formal record. Okay, so those comments you. were not, were not scheduled to be read. I'm just used to it being read, so thank you. Councilmember Denson, they're also listed on the agenda currently online if people are listening and want to see the other written comments. Uh, Councilmember Ibersol. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think we just, I, I, I want to make sure that we uh, move this as quickly as possible because I know that people's uh, lives are being impacted by this, um, both economically and psychologically. Uh, I understand there is. Uh, Obviously, both sides of this argument have been uh, presented. Um, 
I, I do believe that rentals are going to be the future of or a, a future component of Gig Harbor. It's a beautiful town. Uh, it's a vacation destination. Uh, we have a lot of activities and those activities are going to continue to grow, especially once we have our sports uh, complex built and uh, our maritime parks. So, uh, you know, short-term rentals are going to be a reality in our community, but we do need to have uh, policies in place that are uh, both protect our community, uh, protect the renters, the landlords, um, and, and our city as well. So, uh, I, but I do hope that we move this forward exp expeditiously. Thank you. Council Member Franich. Yeah, I uh, echo what Council Member Abersall had to say there. And uh, for me, I think the, uh, you know, it's, it's not my intention to uh, try and move this towards a ban of uh, a complete ban of short term rentals. I think the fourth, whereas it says the city's zoning code doesn't directly address short term rentals as a land use nor provide any direct regulations and the 10th whereas that says the city has not had sufficient time to fully evaluate the number of existing short-term rentals the effects they could have on the community and s and any necessary mitigating zoning controls that pretty much sums it up for me i think that this is um, a proactive step that we're taking to investigate this matter. And we don't know what the, the outcome is going to be. I mean, the planning commission may hear this. I'll be really interested to hear the information that they gather and their interpretation of that information. And then it will come back to the council and the seven of us can have a discussion on those findings and decide um, what action we want to take, if any. Um, I think that this is, well, it, it, I, you know, I've heard from a few people on this um, over the last two weeks, and, and I think people are, some people have jumped to the conclusion that this is the first step in banning them completely, as jurisdictions have done all around us. And for me personally, with the information that I have right now, that is not my intent. But until I get Further clarification on a lot of information, especially that will come from the Planning Commission, and I know they will be taking public testimony, then we can have an intelligent discussion on 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 the issue. So, yeah, I will support um, moving this to the Planning Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rodenberg. Yes, we all, uh, council people and the mayor uh, and others, received a letter today from a uh, community member that is a, uh, a licensed attorney in the state of Washington, as well as Washington, D.C., and as well as the state of Alaska. And in there, he uh, called out case law. He called out uh, things where, in his opinion, uh, uh, we need to be very careful not to violate the Constitution of the United States, nor the Constitution of the state of Washington by picking winners and losers and not giving uh, an opportunity to someone who lives in a certain part of town uh, when we allow somebody else to have a, uh, a similar opportunity in another part of town. So we haven't talked about the legalities of this yet. So I'm hoping that the, his whole point was, and I agree that we should certainly send this on to the planning commission. So, um, based upon even just alone the legal arguments uh, that we need to be aware of, I support sending it to the uh, Planning Commission. I do, though, have uh, plenty of ideas on, on policy because I use VRBOs uh, frequently, So, uh, and I know how they do it in other jurisdictions. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, all the data being collected. So I'm going to support the resolution of the ordinance. Thank you. Council Mayor Hines. Yes, um, I support uh, Council Member Frenich's uh, comments and position on this. Um, I think we're taking a step forward here to at least go look at what might be the status of this situation and what action may be appropriate. And uh, yeah, I'm sure the legal aspects will be considered uh, in that discussion. Um, but 
as far as immediately prejudging this thing as a, uh, a bad and evil thing, uh, I'm definitely uh, against that. We should always be in a situation where we can exercise an open mind and uh, some judgment with a good process. So I will definitely be voting for this. Okay, are there um, uh, last council comments? Okay, there's a motion, there's a second. We're gonna do a roll call. Uh, all those in favor, uh, say aye. Council member Aversold. Aye. Council member Dinson. Aye. Council member Franich. Aye. Council member Himes. Aye. Council member Markley. Aye. Council member Rodenberg. Aye. Council member Wook. Aye. Okay. A motion passed uh, seven. Uh, Seven zero, and so it will uh, be directed to the planning commission. Uh, we will move on to uh, old business number two, which is public hearing and ordinance fourteen sixty six and adoption of findings of fact. The reporters are from our community development director Katrina Knudsen. Go ahead, Katrina. Thank you, Mayor. I'm attempting to be. Uh, technical, technologically savvy right now. I'm going to try to share my screen and not lose you all. Can you see the screen, everyone? Yes. Okay. Um, good evening, council members, mayor, and um, public listening in. Tonight, uh, we're asking council to conduct a public hearing on Ordinance 1466, which established interim zoning controls related to um, House Bill 1220, which is a state bill pertaining to emergency shelters and housing. A uh, very brief background for those that may not know or may not have been at the last meeting. The state legislature enacted uh, engrossed second substitute House Bill signed by the governor on May 12th. This uh, bill is regarding transitional housing, permanent supportive housing, and emergency shelters. It was done in part to address the ongoing affordable housing and homelessness crisis within our state, uh, as well as uh, uh, a reaction to several cities in the Puget Sound area putting out all right, outright bans on emergency shelters within their jurisdictions. The bill requires all jurisdictions to undertake immediate actions as well as long-term actions that will be addressed in the periodic updates of the comprehensive plans for 2024. In response to this state mandate, the city council passed ordinance 1466 on September 27th. The ordinance again established interim zoning controls uh, pursuant to the RCW on the screen. Similar to the previous action taken, there are three actions that we're requesting the council to take this evening. Number one is to conduct the required public hearing. Number two is to adopt the whereas statements within the ordinance as findings. And three, to direct the interim zoning regulations to the planning commission for a formal recommendation before the city council's February 28th, 2022 meeting. I should mention that that is also the goal of the previous action, uh, a no later date than February 28th to come to council. Very brief overview of this bill that is linked online for those listening online. Uh, it's a pretty long um, bill, but it is linked there for your reading pleasure. But to summarize, section one um, changes the housing portion of the Growth Management Act goals from encouraging affordable housing to requiring that cities and other jurisdictions uh, plan for affordable housing. This section can be accommodated through the 2024 periodic update of the city's comprehensive plan. Section two, uh, the bill is requiring jurisdictions to inventory, analyze, plan for, and accommodate dwelling units for moderate, low, very low, and extremely low households. It's also required, uh, it also requires jurisdictions to inventory those types of um, housing and shelters. This can also be accommodated through the 2024 periodic update. 
I will note, however, after reaching out to the Washington State Department of Commerce, the guidance for how to conduct section number two has not yet been issued. And so we're not exactly sure um, the cost or the, uh, uh, the scope of what that inventory and um, analysis will be. Section number three is really what the interim regulations were put in place to address. This section of uh, the bill preempts local authority to prohibit shelters and certain housing types. The bill added a section into state law in uh, 35A21 stating that a code city with Cape Harbor is shall not prohibit transitional housing or permanent supportive housing in any zones which residential dwelling units or hotels are allowed. Additionally, a code city shall not prohibit indoor emergency shelters and indoor emergency housing in any zones in which hotels are allowed. These requirements became effective as of September 30th, 2021 and required city action. Um, the bill did allow for jurisdictions to put in reasonable conditions for occupancy and spacing, which the interim regulations attempted to do. Just very briefly, if the city chose not to adopt interim zoning controls uh, it, for this bill, effectively what would happen is the city would not have regulations for any of these uses, and therefore we would have to permit outright these, um, these uses that would be permitted by state law. So effectively state law would then uh, trump the city's action. Section four is not um, applicable to the city because we are a code city. Section five of this um, bill stated that uh, the cities are prohibited from using moratoria or interim zoning controls to prohibit building permit applications for such uses. Uh, so effectively, if the city were to have issued a moratorium stating emergency shelters are prohibited outright, that would have been illegal and against uh, state law. And then section six just added in definitions of emergency housing, emergency shelter, and moderate income household, because those definitions did not exist other um, bias within state law. The interim zoning regulations that were passed at the last meeting, again, address the items that we were required to by state law, including the transitional housing and permanent supportive housing, which uh, within the regulations conditionally allow in all zones except for PI and ED zones. And chapter 1755 has been added in with specific conditions. These uses would, will be conditionally allowed, which would require a conditional use permit, as well as public notification of any siting of these uses which again is more restrictive than what would be um, allowed under state law currently. For emergency shelters and emergency housing, um, again, we are required to allow for these uses in any zones within the city that hotels are allowed. And so these uses are under the interim regulations conditionally allowed um, only in the following zones, which is RB2, DB, B2, C1, and PCDC. And likewise, with the above, a special section uh, for the interim regulations has been added to Chapter 1757, which outlines specific conditions. These uses, again, will be conditionally allowed with a conditional use permit required, including public notification, so the public will have an opportunity to comment on any of these applications the city receives. Uh, these maps show on the left in the green zones in which the transitional housing and permanent supportive housing would be conditionally allowed. And then on the right is where in the red are the zones which hotels are currently permitted. So that is where emergency shelters and emergency housing would be allowed. There were several public comments that um, it was not easy to read these maps when we had them online. And so our GIS analyst, Mike Simmons has recreated these to be put online that show better uh, outline street names better so that folks can look at kind of where their residence is compared to um, some of these uses. So what will the city do in the six month interim? Again, tonight, the public hearing on October 11th. And then if council does forward this um, pursuant to staff's recommendation to the planning commission, the planning commission would then 
um, consider this with a public hearing and a recommendation and a draft sort of calendar of what this will look like is October, November staff analysis. This will allow us to um, cross-check state law, cross-check our code, um, talk to some other experts and uh, look at some of what the other cities have done to see if there's, we can make our interim regulations um, better for our citizens. We then will take a recommendation and a lot of documentation from our analysis to the planning commission and hold work sessions with them on this. Um, all coming up to a public hearing in which the public will be notified and be able to come and testify on the regulations and see if we can make further improvements to those. Again, the planning commission recommendation, um, if passed tonight with uh, council's recommendation to go to them would have a full recommendation on these to council by February 28th, 2022 council meeting. Subsequent to that, the council will then have its own process in February and March looking at these regulations, which will again allow for public comment and further consideration and amendment of the regulations. So again, this evening, um, we're requesting the council conduct a public hearing. We're requesting the council adopt the whereas statements located within ordinance 1466, as well as direct the interim regulations to the planning commission for a formal recommendation on or before the February 28th, 2022 council meeting. And those that concludes my remarks and I'm available for any questions. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Knudsen. Um, any clarifying questions from council on this? Councilmember Member Markley. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, Katrina, I had a couple of questions that came in. Um, one was, and I don't know if you can answer this now or maybe we can add this to the FAQ, but there was, um, someone was asking if a, if an emergency shelter is built in the city, can a day, war day either warming or cooling center offer services at the same time? Because there was wording in the ordinance that said that there could only be one emergency shelter operating at a time. I'm assuming that means an overnight shelter, only one overnight shelter, and that like a, a pop-up cooling center or warming center could operate at the same time uh, whether it's a church um, holding it or some other um, business that opens their business for a cooling center. But that was a question that was asked. And so I wanted to um, get clarification on that and we can add that to the FAQ. And then the other question was also about um, if there were a, a church or a nonprofit that have their own programs that they're operating like um, that are overnight services, can those operate at the same time as a main emergency shelter if they're within the, I think it's a half a mile apart from each other, they have to be at least a half a mile apart. But I think they were asking specifically if it's a, if it's a church or a, or a nonprofit and they have a, a very sm smaller amount of beds available than a large emergency shelter, would they be able to operate um, at the same time or would that be prohibited? So that's another question to add to the FAQ. Uh, Council Member Markley, the, the definition of the emergency shelter from the state is a facility that provides temporary shelter for individuals or families who are currently homeless. Um, emergency shelter may not require occupants to enter into a lease or an agreement. And it also stipulates that emergency shelter facilities may include day and warming centers that do not provide overnight accommodations. How I would interpret this is that the emergency shelters can have warming and cooling within them, but then a separate use that is just for warming and cooling would likely not be an emergency shelter. So that would not necessitate more than one being at the same time. Um, as for the church or nonprofits, that is a really good question that we want to look into during the planning commission process, because we need to be able to look at where our churches are in the city and if they fall into the, the red area of the map um, right. to kind of see if the churches could allow for emergency shelters, right? So right. Um, that's something that we're hoping to do and provide more information to the churches as we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Any other clarifying questions for staff? Yes, Council Member Franich. So, uh, Katrina, on page 17 of 34, at the very top, it's a carryover from subsection A, which talks about the inventory and analysis of existing and projected housing needs and it identifies the number of housing units necessary to manage projected growth as provided by the Department of Commerce. And that is underlined, so I'm assuming that's new language. And I don't know if you can speak to this, maybe our state legislature would be a, a better person to ask this. Do you know why the Department of Commerce was included in this? The Department of Commerce is the main state agency that is basically the overseer of the Growth Management Act. So anything that has a requirement for a jurisdiction to accomplish under the Growth Management Act, the Department of Commerce is effectively the um, moderator of all of that. So we do ultimately report to the Department of Commerce for uh, the housing needs assessment, our comprehensive plan, any comprehensive plan amendments that we make, they all have to go through the Department of Commerce for state review. So they, they added that in this section for consistency with the rest of the Growth Management Act. Yes, that was added in here. I can't state why it was added, but it, what it appears to be is to be consistent with the other requirements that we report to the Department of Commerce. Uh, effectively, the, the city doesn't report to the state legislature, we report to their administrative agency, which is the Department of Commerce. Well, uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll say the rest of my comments because they're not clarifying uh, comment. So I'll, I'll, I'll reserve the rest of my statements for after we get done with the public. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now I will open up the public hearing. Um, the public hearing is now open and I will take our first caller. Please state your name and address and uh, we're uh, three minutes. Uh, Kim Foster. Hi, uh, my name is Kim Foster and I live on Burnham Drive. I've been a member of the Greater Gig Harbor Fox Island community for 35 years and consider this to be a wonderful community. And I certainly give credit to Chief Busey and, and others for keeping the character of the downtown community, you know, this bucolic place we live. I happen to be a land use attorney and I've been that for 40 years in the state in multiple jurisdictions. And I hear a lot lately about the state made us do this or the state made us do that. And I have to tell you that I'm very concerned about um, the powers that be in Olympia using the cover of the pandemic and other things to push their agenda through on uh, essentially these emergency basis type of things. And um, I'm, my, my concern is uh, that these things can quickly ruin the character of Gig Harbor and um, they, they can ruin its autonomy to be the kind of place it wants to be. And we've seen what these policies have done to downtown Seattle. They've destroyed one of the most beautiful cities in the world, what they've done to downtown Olympia, the areas around Green Lake. And so my concern in this is that as you move forward, that you try to protect the character of downtown one of the things I think in this ordinance that's somewhat unconstitutional on its face is there's no definition of homeless. Um, certainly we all have compassion and empathy for those, especially families with children that are truly homeless. But we've seen in Seattle and Olympia and in other areas that the term homeless has been co-opted to include, you know, common vagrants and drug addicts and thieves and you know, people with severe mental illness problems are ro roaming the street. And um, I really wanna see that we protect against those. So I would like to see definitions in anything going forward as you cite these things within residential zones to define what exactly homeless is. So we're helping the right people and not just offering one of the most beautiful places in the world to live to common vagrants, just because it's a convenient place to do so. I would also, recommend that you define um, what can be an emergency shelter to specifically exclude things like derelict motorhomes and RVs, 
uh, tiny homes and tent cities, um, things that would have a deleterious effect on our lifestyle and safety um, in downtown uh, Gig Harbor as well. I might also um, uh, suggest that IDs be required so that we can make sure that these people who are showing up as quote homeless end quote are indeed um, not criminal backgrounds and things like that. So our kids are still safe to wander around town and, and to use the park facilities. So as you move forward, um, you know, I'd be more than happy to um, participate going forward with the experience I've had in other jurisdictions, but I just really caution you to be really super careful about the safety aspects of this because the state's dictate, dictate is essentially to allow these in every residential area of the city. And, and that's just really, really troubling. Um, and, and I hope it is for you too. And, and like I said, uh, good luck moving forward on this. I, I, I just um, am concerned a lot with safety. And I just have one other quick thing. And you're, on past, the, uh, you're past your sure. time. Okay. I, I, I just had a book that I was going to suggest that the museum acquire for the Puyallup Indians. Um, it's called the Puyallup Nisqually by Marion Smith, which is a history of okay, the please, Puyallup Indians. Please go ahead and send that to us. I'd be happy. And we're sure. at, almost at four minutes. And so, but I, I'd be happy to hear about that. So please send it to us. Okay. Any other callers? Um, callers, you can push start, press uh, star nine on your phone. Um, you can also, there's too many sheets here. <laughs> but I have said it several times. So please press star nine on your phone if you wish to comment. And then you may need to press star six to unmute yourself. Any other callers wish to comment? Okay, I will close the public hearing at this time. Uh, Council Member Aversol. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, a lot of thoughts here. Uh, first of all, you know, of course, uh, to anyone who is homeless or seeking refuge, my heart goes out, out to them. But uh, I really do feel that there's something more to this um, than just kind of meets the eye, in my opinion. Uh, I do feel that this is kind of the state uh, laying the groundwork for something that they may be preparing to do that will definitely have an impact on all the communities within Washington State. But I noticed that the eviction moratorium is going to end on the 31st. Uh, the language that the governor used uh, before that uh, in the press statement said that they were going to extend it for one more month. So and that, was, that was before the uh, October 31st deadline was set. So in my opinion, it feels like the state knows that they're gonna uh, end that eviction moratorium. They're not gonna renew it. Of course, I, I'm speculating here, but just it, it kind of feels like they're laying the groundwork here uh, for this. And they're you know, basically putting it out there so they have a legal excuse to, you know, in effect, create an eminent domain type uh, situation where they can just, you know, I won't use the word seize, but take over uh, folks' hotels and, uh, you know, place rental places uh, to house people. We've all seen on the news and, and watch news stories where we have uh, communities that have homeless camp encampments that spring up. Uh, they become an eyesore. They become a, a legal issue. They become, um, you know, a threat to the community. Um, Pierce County or any any municipality for that matter. They just seem to be shifting these folks around. And I think they also recognize that that's not working as well. Uh, so they're probably looking for some kind of, um, not permanent, but something that's already established like a hotel, a church, uh, something like that, that they can you know, basically legally just seize and say, you know, you're now going to be housing people who um, you're not really prepared to, to treat or deal with um, in the sense that, you know, hotelers are not um, doctors, they're not drug counselors, they're not psychological counselors. And many of the people who are homeless or seeking refuge uh, need those resources. And so I myself, I just, I think this is a, um, an underhanded trick by the state. And I think this is what they're gonna be imposing us. I, I really hope I'm wrong on that issue, um, but that's kind of where I feel that this is going. So I, I can't really support this. I know it's being imposed on us. Um, I didn't support it in the last meeting and, um, I will essentially be voting against this. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Wook. 
Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in keeping as much control and as much local control as we can on this issue and not just opening it up to the state. And so I think that going forward to the Planning Commission is a way for us to have some local control over this. Therefore, I move to adopt whereas clauses contained within ordinance number 1466 as findings of fact in support of adoption of the interim zoning controls and direct this matter to the Planning Commission. Second. I second that. Okay, Councilmember Gibson seconded. Councilmember Franich. Yes, Katrina, um, do homeless people fall into the definition of transitional housing? Let me read you the definition of transitional housing. This is from RCW 8436043. And that means a project that provides housing and supportive services to homeless persons or families for up to two years and that has as its purpose facilitating the movement of homeless persons and families into independent living. Okay, yep. well, that, that, that answers that question. Um, you know, I, I share a lot of the same concerns as Council Member Aversol. Um, I also heard Ms. Knudsen say that if we don't do something, then we're gonna be at the state's mercy. And that is a, it's a horrible place to be. I mean, I think you all know, you know, I'm about local control and I think that is paramount and it should be something that we strive for all the time. And this is one more um, act by the state that is taking away local control. And what really, you know, let alone the local control at the bottom of in, in on page 17 of 34, which is referring to the RCW, the bottom of that page, it is, um, you know, it, it's making, it's subjective at best. It's, it's making a lot of assumptions. It gets into racially disparate, disparate impacts, exclusionism, just, just a whole lot of words that are um, assumptions at best. And uh, you know, I'm just so disappointed in the state legislature for uh, forcing this on jurisdictions. Um, but in light of the fact that if we don't move this forward, at least to the planning, I don't know what will happen after our, when it's a final vote to put this in place. This is just moving it forward to the planning commission for now uh, to do the due diligence. Uh, you know. Uh, so I, I, I will probably support this to move forward to the Planning Commission and really need to, to look at the ins and outs of this uh, legally um, before I make a final vote on uh, putting this into an ordinance form. So anyway, just some comments. Thank you. Councilmember Markley. Uh, yes, thank you. I also support moving this forward to the Planning Commission uh, to do some digging. Um, I, I think too, there's having personally seen how some really amazing 501c3s do transitional housing. Most often, if it is a reputable organization, you won't even know that that house is a transitional house. That's how it's supposed to work. And I've, and I've seen it work personally firsthand that way. And so I'm hoping that through this process, we can dispel some of the myths around transitional housing and some of the fears that are coming along with this ordinance that um, are understandable if you don't completely understand what all of this means. But I'm hoping that as we go through this and as we communicate with the public and let them know what is and is not going to be allowed, what is and is not going to be acceptable, um, we're not going to let Gig Harbor turn into a Seattle tent city. It's We have laws in place that are going to prohibit that from happening. And so I think hopefully the public will be reassured that that is not what this means. It doesn't mean that our parks are going to be filled with tents. It doesn't mean that RVs are going to be lining streets. This is simply something that we need to, we need to look at this 
because it is coming down from the state level. Um, I appreciate the comment that um, one of our citizens made as far as you know, not being bullied by the state. I don't think we need to be bullied by the state, but I think we do need to look at this and look at the, the legal ramifications on both sides. Um, if, if we do something or if we do nothing or what do we do in between um, and really just take a, a strong look at this. This issue is not easy. We all know that. We all know this issue of homelessness is a, is a big deal. And I think people sometimes want to just close their eyes and pretend it's never going to happen in our city. Well, it is happening in our city. There are at least 139 homeless children in our city, in our school district. It's probably higher now. That was the figure last year. And so this is an issue that is, is um, close to my heart because I've met these folks and most of them are not criminals. They're just homeless and, and they are on social security disability, they're on the lowest income they can receive, maybe $800 a month tops. So I just, you know, that we we need to look at this with compassion, but we also need to look at this as, as, a, as a city, as a business, you know, as well. We don't want to ruin the character of our city, of course, but we also need to recognize that there are people suffering tremendously in our city and not discount them as criminals and just make that a blanket statement. So anyway, um, I'm just happy that the Planning Commission is going to dig into this and hopefully we can uh, put, put some things at rest, put some myths to rest. Thank you. Good choice of words from Councilmember Markley. Um, Councilmember Rodenberg. I'm sorry, you're on mute. Thank you. I appreciate the comments by uh, Mr. Foster and I am going to support pushing this on to uh, the Planning Commission as well. And I hope that when it comes back to council that uh, Mr. Foster will recontact us. I thought he had some really good ideas that could help us uh, craft uh, a, a good ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I uh, we've got everyone's hands are not raised; <laughs> they're down. So we're gonna we've got a motion. I'm gonna go through the roll call again uh, with these certain issues. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Council member on the motion at hand. Council member Aversol. Aye. Council member Jensen. Aye. Council member Franich. Aye. Councilmember Hines. Aye. Councilmember Markley. Aye. Councilmember Rodenberg. Aye. Councilmember Wook. Aye. Okay, motion passes six to one. We've got um, <clears throat> uh, old business number three, which is second reading and adoption of ordinance. Anyway, it's, it's moved to go to the Planning Commission, directed. Uh, second reading and adoption of ordinance 1468, accepting North Creek Gig Harbor LLC property donation. The report is uh, Public Works Director Jeff Langhill. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Uh, this is second reading, as Mayor stated, of an ordinance uh, for transferring uh, property donation from North Creek LLC to the City of Gig Harbor. I'm going to just quickly bring it up so we can all remember which property we're talking about here. Okay. Uh, for Orientation purposes, this is Burnham Drive uh, on the right side of your screen, Harbor Hill, Burnham Drive, roundabout is the north side of your screen, and the Cushman Trail uh, is in the, in the middle of your screen running north-south, and the property is highlighted in teal. So that's the property we're looking at. Um, this is uh, about a third of an acre, uh, and the property owner already dedicated or sold a small portion of it because of... Uh, Cushman Trail location, and now the property owner has decided that the rest of the property isn't uh, enough value for them, so they decided to donate to the city. Uh, the city staff has reviewed and completed the appropriate steps for the city's property purchase checklist, and we feel it's appropriate now to go ahead and transfer the property. I'd be happy to answer any questions, but that's all I had to report for tonight. Any clarifying questions from council? Okay, I'm going to open up the public comment. 
Were there any written comments that were turned in, uh, Mr. Pasecki? No, Your Honor. Okay. Do any callers wish to comment on this uh, old business number three? Oh. Okay. I'm going to close the public comment. Uh, Council deliberation and action. Councilmember Himes. I'll jump the gun. Uh, move to approve ordinance 1468 accepting North Creek Gig Harbor LLC property donation. Do I second. have a second? Second was Councilmember Markley. Any deliberation? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion passes. Um, Jeff, what is um, Jim Schaefer's uh, uh, business partner's name? Jim Otnes. Jim Otnes? Correct. I'd like to thank these two gentlemen. I've worked for, they, they approached me about three years ago to donate this property. And um, uh, it's, it's near wetlands right next to our bridge. It may end up be having a couple parking spaces as the years go by for the Cushman Trail. So um, it was actually brought on by, uh, we, we, we get benches donated, we get um, water fountains, but land, it's great. We appreciate uh, the public coming forward and donating land. So Jim Schaefer and Jim Otis, thank you very much. And he asked me last council meeting, did it pass? And I said, one more and I'll let you know. So, okay, we're on to new business. One item only tonight. Uh, first reading of ordinance 1469, repealing GHMC 5.14, bring your own bag. Our report is from jo our city clerk, interim city clerk, Josh Stecker. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, council members. Um, this is first reading of ordinance 1469, which will repeal chapter 5.14 of the Gig Harbor Municipal Code. That's referred to as the bring your own bag act. Um, council adopted this chapter of the code in fall of 2018. Um, basically is uh, required that all businesses and stores stop providing disposable plastic bags and instead use recycled paper bags or thick plastic bags. Um, in the 2020 legislative se session, the state legislature passed a very similar act for the state um, that in, that's a statewide requirement um, that largely supersedes our bag ban. Um, on your agenda bill, I've listed several areas where the state's mandate conflicts with ours. I'm just gonna go through those really quickly. Um, the state requires a pass-through charge of eight cents per paper or thick plastic bag that businesses provide. The city's act does not require businesses to, to collect that pass-through charge. Um, the city's act actually allows, gives businesses the option, but prevents businesses from charging more than the actual cost of the bag. Um, so that provision is, is actually nullified on, in our code now. The state requires reusable bags to be at least 20% post-consumer recycled content. And that's a floating target as the years go by, that, that could go up to as high as 40% post-consumer recycled content. Um, the city's code does not have a provision for recycled content. The city allows distribution of previously distributed single-use bags. So if somebody brought in used um, bags that used to be allowed, businesses could redistribute those. The state does not allow that. Um, enforcement of the state's bag ban is entirely the responsibility of the Department of Ecology. They won't come to our police department or a code enforcement office for help. Um, it's, it's completely up to them to monitor, to send out warnings, to levy fines. Um, so that is completely taken off of our plate now. So there's those that there's kind of a, a myriad of other minor things that are not consistent across the board um, that will create confusion if both of these acts are in place. So staff is recommending that the city repeal its bag ban and retire, rely entirely on the states. Um, the city's bag ban is currently suspended for the duration of the COVID-19 emergency. Um, so for however long our city's emergency proclamation stays in place, our bag ban is suspended. The state's bag ban went into effect on October 1st. So that's another point of confusion that we're, we could be running into with our businesses now. 
Um, the city has taken out, um, done quite a bit of like work in getting the word out to businesses that that the state's ban is in effect now, and it does supersede ours and, and notifying businesses that they need to comply. So we have, have gotten gotten that underway. I don't think we've had too many issues with that, um, at least not that I've heard of since October 1st. The other aspect of this is that at the same time when we adopted the bag ban, we also adopted the um, single use food service wear litter reduction code, which is the the ban on plastic utensils, plastic straws, plastic containers, et cetera. That is also suspended during the COVID-19 emergency and that will not be affected by this repeal. So that ban will still be in place and we'll start enforcing that once the COVID-19 emergency lifts. Um, this is first reading. We'll come back for second reading next at the next meeting. Um, if there are for any questions, if there's any from council. Okay. I don't see any questions from count, yeah, council member Franich. So I thought that, it, and I'm looking at uh, page one of six, the first bullet point there uh, where it talks about the eight cents charge. Um, if the city uh, unless the the city already has, I thought that we had a five cent maximum charge. Our, our maximum charge in, in chapter 5.14 um, is up to the actual cost of the bag. So uh, it can't exceed whatever the business paid for it. Okay, well, I thought council member Himes had, had, had made a um, motion at the time to talking about a five cent uh, maximum on there. I, I don't remember the, the, the language talking about uh, or the cost of the bag. Um, if he cares to speak to that, he can. It's really kind of inconsequential. But uh, on the page two of eight where it talks is up to a $250 fine. Is that per occurrence or is that um, one time? or each time the Department of Ecology goes there? That is, let me look at Department of Ecology's FAQs really quick because they have that um, listed. It says repeated and continuous non-compliance may result in up to a $250 fine. They don't go into detail on their website on how and when, how often and when they'll enforce that. And they said May too. Okay. Yeah. Pardon me, Mayor. I, uh, they use the word May. Yeah. So I, I'm just wondering, and, and you know, I, I, I don't mean to be rude, but I'm just wondering who Mr. Andrews uh, to Somig. Soming, council member, yes. I'm Andrew Soming, I'm, I'm uh, filling in for your regular city attorney, Daniel Kenny. Oh, oh, okay. I thought maybe you were with the state or something, but. Uh, no, no, no. And and, and uh, since I, I have everyone's uh, attention, I, I am looking at RCW 70A.530.0406, which indicates the $250 violation or civil penalty each calendar day of operation or activity in violation of this chapter comprises a new violation. So it looks like it's going to be each day is a $250 uh, fine. Thank you. Thank you. Council Mayor Himes. Uh, yes, the, the issue of reusable plastic bags that are distributed at the point of sale. Okay. I, I noticed. Um, Already, these things are springing up all over the place. Um, Target's got them. Uh, Albertson's got them. Uh, paper's on its way out. And my question is, when we passed our ban, we were thinking in terms of real reusable bags, like the ones that got the linen stuff threaded through them. They're really, they're really reusable bags. Um, and, and my question is, with this shift and this eight cents charge, um, if this continues, do these bags, do these 
so-called compostable plastic bags, okay, do they disintegrate in salt water? We started this discussion with we were contaminating the oceans and right here in Gig Harbor. And I'm sitting there saying, hey, we, we you know, this thing has been shifted from paper as a backup to plastic now as the re, re compostable recyclable is a magic word, okay, uh, that these bags have to be, which means in my mind, you don't put them in the ocean, you put them in a compost pile and let it, let it do its thing. My fear here is that this thing, it, we're going to be right back in the soup again. These, these, these bags are going to end up in the ocean, right in our harbor. And I, I don't know how many years it takes for them to decompose, but we could be right back in the soup. Um, by the way, that, all of this is a nice way of saying, I think our, our, our version of this thing is better than the state version. Okay, I'll just be, get right to the point. Okay. Uh, and by the way, the market forces, I will say that we set a five minutes, five cent maximum, maximum. And my theory was that market forces would drive it to zero here for paper bags. It did it in less than three months. Home Depot started with a charge. Albertson started with a charge. Target started with a charge. Guess what? Three months later, it was all gone. The only thing that was left was that crazy question on the screen on the self-service screen that said, how many bags do you have, okay? And no matter what you put in there, it didn't charge you anything, okay? So I think there's both an economic issue, but it's also a functional issue here. And, and so my question is, 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 is there anything out there that says these bags, these wonderful, they say they'll go 150 times, okay? That, that's the, that's the so-called uh, criteria on them. Do these things decompose in water, plain and simple? I don't think Andrew's going to find that in his rule book. <laughs> Was that a clarifying question, sir? So okay. the city's the city's code does not have a provision for compostable <laughs> bags. The state's does, and the the pass through charge is optional for compostable bags. Um, mm -hmm. in the state's program. The city does not reference them at all. Um, the city allows for the distribution of the thicker uh, 2.25 mil plastic bags, but we don't address the issue of compostable plastic bags. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But yeah. I, I, I guess what I'm saying is the 2.5 mil. Okay. That was a real recyclable bag. Okay. Right. And, and throwing that thing overboard would, would, would be a little bit of a chore. Uh, right. and, 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 and you, and you'd lose quite an investment in whatever that bag was. These things are only eight cents a copy. Okay. So they're, they're going to become, you know, if you lose one, Hey, no problem. Um, you know, so be it. Anyway, uh, if, if we don't have the answer here, I'll do some research on this, but uh, I, I am not right now so keen on this idea. Um, and by the way, this, this is patterned right off of Seattle, right off of Seattle. And um, they don't seem to have all the answers to the secrets of the universe up there. So I'll just leave it at that. So uh, I'm going to make a couple of quick comments with regards to the bags will they uh, decompose in water we can certainly look at that and the real bottom line is any portion of our ordinance that is not as stringent as the states the states is going to over uh, supersede ours is that correct josh that's correct so yeah the charge that the, that the state requires for bags will be charged and the businesses will have to collect it and this the state, uh, another clarifying point here is the state is going to allow the 2.25 mil, millimeter bags, but in four years, in 2026, those are going to be outlawed too, and they will have to be at least a minimum thickness of four mils. So the whole 2.25 bag is going to become obsolete very soon. In four years, you said? In four years, yes. Okay. Okay, any other clarifying questions? Okay, I'm gonna open up the public comment. Were there any uh, written questions, Tony? No, Your Honor, there was not. Okay. Uh, if there's any callers that wish to comment on uh, new business item one, please press star nine or star six on your phone.
Okay, I don't see any public comment on this. I'll close the public comment portion. Council, deliver, um, we will actually, this is first reading. So this will come back at the next council meeting. And with that, we're going on to council reports and comments. Planning and building committee meeting was on October 4th. And here to speak to it was council, is council member Hines. Yes, we uh, had our, I think it's either the third or fourth session on the uh, upcoming uh, population and housing targets for the and underlying buildable lands report for the vision 2050 um, uh, objectives or targets, you want to call them, which by the way, it goes right now, the span goes from 2020 to 2044, the growth. And uh, I believe we will be having a study session on this on the 26th of October. Uh, and all I can say is uh, come prepared. Uh, you've all mentioned uh, local control. You've mentioned the uh, character of the city. You've mentioned a whole series of things. Well, uh, this is about as intrusive as you can get, okay? And by the way, this is the law of the land, GMA. And uh, you'll see data in there that says, uh, Basically, Pierce County, and, and what I can tell, everybody's not doing a very good job. We are not meeting our target. We, we exceeded our targets. But by the way, there's a lot of jurisdictions out there who were way out of whack, like 20, 27% of the way there. We were 93% of the way from the 2010 to 2030. So that'll be an issue. Uh, I know some of you remember back to 2018, I believe it was when uh, we suggested slowing things down, okay? And, uh, and by the way, I didn't know at the time that we were shooting the lights out on our objective. We were way over objective. And we were severely criticized by the Department of Commerce, okay? Those of you who remember that little experience. So, uh, Come prepared. Uh, it's going to be an interesting session. It's going to be emotional. I can guarantee it. And uh, and by the way, um, the the uh, uh, this is more than just a factual discussion. This is a this is a this is a policy discussion. Really, what's going to end up in of uh, what do we want? Gig Harbor to look like in 2044. It's as simple as that. If we get bludgeoned into an extremely aggressive population and dwelling growth target, um, character, a few other things out the window. So come prepared. 26th of October. At 3.30. 3.30, great. Thank you, Councilmember Member Himes. Um, we will be putting out uh, the white paper that we've discussed with planning and building a week prior to that meeting. So council will have uh, information summarized prior to it. Great. And, and now we will hear from the park. We had parks uh, commission meeting on October 8th, on top, on, excuse me, on October 6th. Council member Aversol. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you're correct, we have parks commission meeting October 6th. Uh, we, we approved the minutes, then uh, we had a pros plan update uh, from Ben Coronado, who's our chair, and Mary Barber. Uh, they did a recap of the survey that was taken, and uh, some of the public comments were that the public is concerned about safety issues uh, that came up uh, within the parks, uh, specifically car prowls and bike safety. Uh, another thing that was taken from the survey is that uh, younger people want more amenities at our parks, uh, but they also want us to preserve the parks that we have and not acquire more parks. Um, they want expanded trails, they want um, pres the preservation of green space, and also to expand the Cushman Trail. Um, Jeff Lingham then gave us a Parks um, Commission work plan for 2022. Uh, he gave us updates on the Eden Boat Railway carriage. He said that is almost completed. It should be done early uh, December. 
uh, the Ed and Boat Landscape Plan, the contractor is ahead of schedule. And then uh, one of the parks commissioners, Will Appleton commented on the tree heights uh, out in front of um, along Harbor View Drive. And in that park, he's concerned that uh, we don't plant trees that eventually grow up and become so tall that they block the view uh, for the homes that are there. Uh, Jeff also mentioned that we potentially will have a parks manager hired by sometime uh, November. I think Tony was alluding to that earlier and that the canoe and kayak racks are in place and that the public racks are uh, coming. We also took public comment from Sarah Linhardson. Uh, she pr pr promoted the idea that uh, Gig Harbor or create more community gardens. Uh, she recommended Shop Park as a potential place to do that in. Sorry, here. Where my notes at? Um, they also talked about the pros plan uh, stakeholder survey. Uh, they got an update. Our uh, the the contractor that they're hiring, uh, I guess, for that has unique uh, methods of interacting with the public and getting people for the virtual open house. Uh, so they're excited about that. And uh, they also are looking for a master plan for all parks. That is their goal, um, or a parks guide and development plan for all the parks. And uh, that concludes my notes on the Parks Commission meeting. Thank you. And then we have a Board and Commission Canada Review Committee meeting, which was today, October 11th. Council Member Aversold again. Yes, thank you. Um, October 11th, our meeting today, uh, the minutes were approved. Um, we talked about uh, basically some rules that we're uh, looking at as far as membership uh, in regards to membership on our boards. Uh, we have some citizens who potentially could be co in, in violation of our codes who sit on our boards. Um, Katrina, our community development director, Katrina Knudsen, uh, did, of course, advocate that we have due process allowed for all of our citizens. Um, she is going to be asking our uh, attorney, Danny McKinney, about the definition of um, good standing uh, for our code compliance. Um, we also are going to be getting uh, assistance on board where, who live outside the city of, uh, or the EPA will be uh, given notice um, that we're going to be potentially adopting a resolution that says you have to live within the city or the, or the UGA. And anyone on um, the board who is potentially outside of those areas after this resolution is adopted will be given a six months notice um, that they either need to correct that or they may have to lose their position on the on their board. We're also looking at uh, council rules. Um, any any board member who's, or, or a person who comes in violation of a city code. Uh, can they remain a member and uh, can the council delegate the removal of them um, to a, a staff person? We're going to be contacting uh, Daniel Kinney for that as well. And that concludes our uh, boards and candidate review committee meeting. Yeah, I might add to that, you know, um, you know, kind of what he said, but um, so if someone, some, so new people wouldn't be kicked off if they were not compliant. But if they if they joined the committee and they signed the the um, paper to be on, they would realize if they moved out of the area that then they would be um, moved off. But that wouldn't happen for what did what did you guys say six months? So that it gave time. But we don't feel like council needs to like broadcast that at a council meeting. So that's kind of more of a city administrator role of it, defining that. So we're going to get that clarity question from Daniel or from our attorney. Yes, thank you for clearing that. Um, taking notes and being cognitive at the same time is somewhat difficult sometimes. Yeah, no problem. Okay, that concludes uh, the council on the meetings. Council comments, uh, Council Member Franich. Well, thank you, Mayor. I think this may come as a surprise to some of you, but. Um, Really kind of been following the, the fish food bank project. Um, 
and their progress with the construction of the building. And it's turned into quite an expensive project for them. And so I, I guess my question is, I, I would like Dave to clarify that, well, Mr. Rodenbach to clarify that what I'm saying is accurate, that the we have received roughly 1.5 million or uh, I'm just rounding it up to our $3 million share of the uh, American Rescue Plan Act. And that's correct. Okay, so, you know, if, if you look at the allowable uses for those funds, uh, there's four categories. And one is to respond to the public health emergency and its negative economic impacts, including assistance to households. The key is their assistance to households, small business and nonprofits. So in looking at the budget, I saw that the mayor had generously had $200,000 in the uh, the budget, and I'm assuming that came out of the general fund, which this money, I'm assuming the American Rescue Plan money is in the budget. And I wasn't sure what what, what where the merit had decided that $200,000 was going to come from. But um, due to the escalating costs of that project, um, I would like to amend the 2021 budget since we have that one point, roughly $1.5 million um, that is not being used at this point to bring back a budget amendment in order to facilitate getting the food bank $500,000 this you, year so, out so of that broke, money. Uh, Councilmember Franish, right when you said the dollar amount, you broke up. So can you say that again? 500, 500,000 of the America Rescue Plan Act money to go towards the construction of the, uh, the food bank. And that would free up the $200,000 that's in the budget right now, um, that's in the proposed budget right now. Um, that we could use for whatever we, we chose to use that could be funded out of the general fund. So um, as per section 2.04.030, uh, I would like to um, bring this suggestion back for discussion at the next meeting. So, um, okay, a couple of thoughts. Um, I, I, first thing, I do find this a little interesting because um, <clears throat> When I reached out to the food bank um, and asked them, you know, I'm putting $200,000 in the budget. Can you show, can you back up my statement by showing us where it's going to go, what it's going to go for? And my response was, well, we, we actually want 400,000. And um, we spent 200 for permitting and we really want four. And I'm like, well, you know, there's a lot of different needs before we start phone for the four. Could you, could you still show me where the 200 is going to go? And everyone has to pay for permitting. I understand that. And so even if you get reimbursed for permitting, I still want to know where it's going to go. I want to know where, where that money is going to go. So would, would you ask your board to send us a statement showing where the money we're going to give you uh, is going to go? And I haven't had, and that was two, that was three weeks ago that I asked that and I haven't got anything. So first thing, whatever we decide to do, I do think that they need to show us substantially, you know, they were gonna build that building anyway. So with, they were gonna build it. So I'd like to know, you know, they had planned for the building, but I'd like to know where, whatever we give, the money's gonna go. Uh, I think I, I think that's a perfectly reasonable request. Okay. And, um, you know, we can have that discussion um, and, and I would hope that, you know, we, we can reach out to the food bank and let them know that this discussion will be coming up. And, and I think you're, you're perfectly, it's a perfectly appropriate answer or question to ask and, and have them answer it. I just believe that some of the costs, I know that they're putting in a very extensive stormwater vault that is going to really help with uh, protecting the, the Donkey Creek basin area and uh so 
you know, I, I think that the costs are, are, are escalating for them. And um, I, I think that they, they serve a, a really good purpose for the community. And it really, you know, it kind of epitomizes what the uh, purpose of, you know, I mean, put it this way, if, it was, if I was back in Washington, D.C., and it was up to me to, to vote to print up, uh, you know, a $2 trillion to dole out to the states, I wouldn't vote for that. But they, they're printing the money up, so we're going to be getting our share of it, and we need to decide, you know, what where it's an appropriate place to spend that money. So, Okay, uh, so could we do this? Since we're not at the, we're not at the budget meeting yet. But um, but it is good to um, to plan ahead. So how about if we um, if we research that we can use that money towards that? So we make sure because otherwise we got to find where it's going to come from, and then we give time for um, the food bank to come back with with the question that we I think we all want to know where the money would go, and then we will have those two clarifying questions. And we'll get closer to the council meeting of the budget to talk about that. Does that sound uh, okay with you? Well, isn't our budget uh, work study session the first one next week? Yeah, but that's to hear from the departments. It's not really to go over what council wants. Uh, it's really to hear from because we are kind of ahead. It's um, I don't have the um, thing right in front of me, but it's it's to go over what the council. What what the departments want, and then right. it's okay. um, it's well, not until November that we well, actually right. It, it, I think it's kind of, kind of time is of the essence, and, and I understand that that you know that's talking about the 2022 budget. I'm more interested in the 2021 budget because we've got the we've received half of that three uh, million dollars, so we have the money now. So I'm looking to get it appropriated in the 2021 budget cycle and not wait till 2022. If the, yeah, I mean, and, and this would be obviously uh, subject to council deliberation on the matter. Okay, well also we, I think we had like the video and the recording downstairs and the HVAC, we had different things. So I'm not saying, I'm not saying that this isn't a bad idea, but we have to shift uh, maybe other things how about if we, since you're talking about 2021, I don't know, we could, maybe we could have a little time at the end of the um, study session so that after we hear from the different departments, we could discuss this in a study session. And that way it'll give um, Tony, myself and Dave time to look at that money that's gonna come in this year and where it was gonna go. And then you can make decisions on that. Well, you know, I, I would I, I would like to get it on the agenda and discuss it coming out of the 2021 budget. Well, that's what I'm talking about. I, we would discuss it at the study session. That's the next study session we have. So well, that's not till when did you say it was? Oh, it's it's next week. These these are these study sessions are next. Um, so, so essentially what, what the mayor is saying is we're going to talk about the 2022 budget next Monday and Tuesday, but at the end of the study session on Monday, we'll reserve a little bit of time to talk about using the ARPA money from 2021 for the purpose that you're talking about. Right. So that's dealing with your curveball. That's, <laughs> does that well, sound good? But I, I would, does that sound, I mean, that's fresh. That's a week from today. Um, well, I, 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 as long as if the, is, is the, the administration is prepared at that meeting, that if the, the majority of the council feels this is important, that we can get something wrapped up and we can get moving on it by the. Well, I think I, I think what we would do is it would still go to the next council meeting. We're not going to I don't think we're going to take that kind of I think you need public comment because there's other people that could say well I want money too so I don't think that's appropriate to pass that at a study session you can no, we, we wouldn't it would just be a yeah. discussion during the study session and then we would put the ordinance together if council gives us the direction to do so right, right. for the for that for the upcoming meeting correct right okay I, can, I, I, would, I, I, I think that's fair 
But I will have to tell you, since I asked them three weeks ago to show well, us where the 200 is going, if they don't show us, that's not going to, they, I encourage you to reach out to them since I already did. Um, and, uh, show us, show us what they're and, and asking that it's going to reimburse. Well, where was the money going to go when you were going to pay for it? That's what I want to know. Uh, you're on mute. I think your questions are, are, are valid and they need to be answered. And I think you could uh, hopefully all those, uh, could come out at, it, during the discussion. So um, I guess maybe I'll try reaching out to them and, and you know, should, let them know this is kind of on my mind. So that shouldn't be too hard. I told this, uh, Ron Cohen is listening. So, um, so they well, it, know that. He is. Uh -oh, he oh, oh. All right. <laughs> so Ron, you have a little homework to let us know. And um, so, and then we have to, Dave, uh, Tony and I, before that study session, we need to look at that money. Yep. Well, We'll, we'll take a look at it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Council Member Wook. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So um, I've been hearing a lot from the folks in Gig Harbor North, and they're very appreciative of the pedestrian crossing lights. They're very grateful and thankful that those got in and got working for those kids up there. And they're really happy that even the adults can cross Morgan Boulevard now. Mm -hmm. So uh, great job for um, great job for our public works and engineering, everybody who was involved in that. I also heard um, this week a wonderful um, compliment to Michelle Thomas, uh, who works for the city. And some people had been working with her and uh, complimented her on how professional and how knowledgeable and how easy she was to work with. So it's it's really nice to hear compliments on our city staff, and I hope that gets passed along. Thank you. Thank you. We'll let them know. Uh, Councilmember Rodenberg. Yes, I I want to thank uh, Councilman Franich for uh, his idea to amend the 2021 budget. I think that's the epitome of the use of those funds, and I support 100% of bringing this up. Uh, and getting consensus of the council before we go to the council meeting. Uh, I don't think that's going to be too difficult to get a hold or to get questions answered from uh, uh, the food bank. I know that there's probably three I know of uh, board members who are listening to this call uh, right now. So uh, thank you, Councilman Franich. Uh, and I look forward to uh, council in, in uh, uh, approving this come Monday, to push to the earliest possible council meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Rodenberg. Councilmember Markley. Uh, yes, thank you. I um, echo Council Councilman Rodenberg's comments, and also thank Councilmember Franich for bringing this up. Um, I had a question for uh, Dave Rodenbach. Um, it's my understanding that these funds have been allocated, but not, not spent yet. We still have these funds in the general fund. Is that correct? Yes, we do. Uh, the, in your preliminary budget, the ending fund balance of the general fund includes the 1,494,000 that we have received. Okay. And then we have an, a second batch of money coming later in 2022. Is that correct? And yes, and that's projected in the ending fund balance for the general fund in for 2022 in your preliminary budget. Okay, great. Yeah, so I fully support bringing this uh, to the study session. I would hope that it would go straight to the next council meeting as time is of the essence to amend the 2021 budget and also for, for the Fish Food Bank uh, to meet certain uh, deadlines um, that they have. They are a tremendous asset to this community and I have done some research into the ARPA funds and it certainly is a worthy cause that is uh, allowable under those ARPA funds. And so um, I would love to see some of those funds go out into the community and not just uh, stay at City Hall. So hopefully um, this will go straight to the council meeting. Um, I appreciate Councilmember Franich wanting to put this on the agenda and uh, respect that he, that he would like to do that. So I hope this will go forward to the agenda. Thank you. Thanks. 
Dave, with you and look where that money is going to be, you know, the, the things we were going to spend it on, we, we can't, we still have to spend it. They were like the heat unit for city hall. So yes, we're going to have to, it's not like we can't spend it. They, it's way past the year. So we are going to tell later this week, tell us where that's going to come from. We'll do. Okay. Thank you. Any other council comments? Okay, great. Well, um, we have announcement of upcoming meetings. We have a public works committee meeting on Tuesday, October 12th at 3 p.m. And what we just talked about, we have the city council study session, Monday, October 18th starts at 2 p.m. Was gonna end at five, might be a little later now, just depending on uh, how far we get on with the other things to, to discuss what we just talked about, which is great. Uh, City Council study session the following day, Tuesday, October 19th, 2 p.m. These are in the council chambers. Uh, masks are required. We are open. It is open to the public as well. So um, with that, uh, thank you all. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Have a great night, everyone. Meeting adjourned.